So good evening and welcome everyone to our August 12th Town Council meeting. Right at the top, we are going to recognize our West, oh. <laughs> I'm anxious to recognize our baseball team, Madam Clerk. This is to inform the general public that this meeting is being held in compliance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975. A notice of this meeting was mailed to the Star Ledger and the West Orange Chronicle on November 23, 2013. A notice of this meeting was also posted on the bulletin board in the Municipal Building, West Orange, and filed in the office of the Municipal Clerk of the Township of West Orange on November 23, 2013. Councilman Cirillo? Present. Councilman Garino? Present. Councilman Kokoviak? Present. Councilwoman Spango? Present. Council President McCartney? Present. Thank you. Okay, so the first thing on our agenda is to recognize the West Orange Cobras, boys traveling baseball team. I would ask the coaches to join me here. Okay, so the real reason we're here, guys, is that I'm gonna read this uh, citation, commendation for you, but we're really here to cheer you on because we understand that you're on your way to a tournament in Ocean City, Maryland, right? So you have your cheering section here. So the town council is proud to recognize the West Orange Cobras traveling team. Playing together for several years, the Cobras participated in two spring leagues, the Big League and the Montville Travel League. They played a total of 34 games between the two leagues, winning the title in the Montville League with an 11 to nine win over the first place team on Father's Day. Three of the Cobras players were selected to participate in the big league's all-star game on June 28th of this year. Sean Brown, JJ Scavella, and Angelo Deer. Hmm. <laughs> prior to the cast on his leg. <laughs> Represented the Cobras well, and they helped lift their team to a 7-4 victory. Additionally, the Cobras played in three baseball tournaments, including the March Madness Tournament, the 14th Annual Mount Olive Marauders Memorial Day Tournament, and the Cal Ripken Easter Classic Tournament. So the town council congratulates the team on their excellent sportsmanship and wishes them continued success, particularly in Ocean City, Maryland. Council President, we'd like to present the township with uh, an extra trophy we got from our Spring League where we won our, our championship this oh, round. Thank you. We're going to call your name and come up. Where are they coming up? All right, let me introduce the 11 you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I am uh, Jason uh, Scavala. I am the head coach of the uh, West Orange Cobras. Um, and that's about it. Okay. <laughs> Let me introduce the boys so they come up here and we can uh, give them a nice round of applause. Uh, I'll start with uh, this young man. He uh, played second base, shortstop. He pitched for us a little bit. He had a real good uh, spring and summer season. JJ Scavala. All right, that's me. Okay, cool. Sue, so send him this one. Sue, so send him this one. Good. All right. This next guy, he uh, he pitched a little bit for us. He uh, he played outfield. He played a little bit of second base. Uh, I've had him since the fall, but I'm still going to mess up his last name, and I apologize. Uh, Mark Michelelli. <laughs> All right. This guy right here, he... Uh, he was our catcher for the spring and uh, 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 summer season. He played a little bit of outfield. Uh, Luke Stennett. All right, this guy, he, uh, he roamed the outfield for us. He controlled the uh, outfield. He was our starting center fielder for most, I mean, for all of the spring and summer season. Jordan Quiles. Uh, because he's one of my <laughs> <laughs> All right, this young man played a little bit of third base, uh, mostly outfield. Uh, definitely got better as uh, as the seasons, you know, from the summer. I'm sorry, from the spring to the summer. He's a real good kid. He's a real hard worker. Andrew Arabona. <laughs> 
All right. I don't know what Coach Tom gave him the nickname Magnet. I call him our little bulldog because he's a one tough little guy. Uh, he played third base. He pitched for us. He also called for us. Uh, Aiden Healy. All righty. This is this uh, young man's first season with us uh, uh, in the spring and in the uh, summertime. Uh, he played mostly outfield. Uh, once again, this kid's a real hard worker. Uh, he showed great improvement as the season went on. Uh, Pharrell Brun. <laughs> Brun? <laughs> as you can see, our last guy, he's a little beat up right now. Uh, unfortunately, he had an injury uh, last, uh, last weekend, but this young man, uh, he was our top pitcher, uh, played first base, third base, a little bit outfield. Uh, once again, this guy's our, uh, our team leader, Angelo Deer. And I also got to uh, uh, introduce my assistant coaches because without them, uh, none of this would uh, be, uh, be possible. I'm not always the easiest guy to work with, but uh, they stick by my side. Uh, through good times and bad. Uh, you guys mostly probably know, but this is uh, Joe Deere. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Tom Orobona. And then everybody line up behind that. All right? All right. Thank you. Tighten it up. Susan, you guys want to get in? If somebody in the middle of the trophy, if the little guy in the middle of the So in the spirit of recognizing young students, I have invited Mahishan here as a National Writing Contest essay winner. United States Capital, United States Capital Historical Society. Uh, yes, um, my name is Mahishan Yanisarian. I live, uh, I live up, up on Clark and Drive here in okay. West Orange. Welcome. And um, I'm, I'm currently a junior at St. Benedict's Preparatory School in, uh, in Newark. 
Um, I've lived in West Orange for a little over a year now, and um, I can say it's pretty much home. And uh, actually, the the essay I wrote was about was about citizens' rights, and um, so actually I have it right here. Um, it was about citizens' rights and the responsibilities of a citizen in a country. And so last December, I decided to enter the contest sponsored by the uh, U.S. National Historical Capital Society. And something I explored was being at home somewhere, and that really connected with me, and being an active citizen. So I'm, I'm just going to read part of this um, to you. Um, I took, a, I took a historical approach to this, so that's, that's what it reflects. Sunlight streamed into City Hall in New York City on June 8, 1789, as Representative James Jackson of Georgia stood to address proposed amendments to the United States Constitution. Jackson had been on record as an opponent of James Madison's Federal Bill of Rights, a document intended to prevent misconstruction or abuse of the Constitution's power. But let me ask, the southern statesman said as he began, what will be the consequence of taking up this subject? Are we going to finish it in an hour? I believe not. It will take us more than a day to complete it. So today, regardless of the contextual spite in this, um, these words serve to remind my fellow citizens of their role in the endless process of exercising their natural rights. History has demonstrated to us the power of the individual. The United States Constitution confers upon each citizen the right to dictate the breadth of our democracy. It has always been the citizen's responsibilities to partake in the democratic process. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution, known as the Bill of Rights, are the primary articles that protect our right to self-govern. The amendments include the right to keep and bear arms, the freedom of speech, religion, press, and petition, the right to due process by law, the protection of powers of the states, and numerous other provisions. So when James Madison introduced the initial draft of the Bill of Rights to the Congress, he resounded a plea of the people. We ought not to disregard their inclina inclination, but expressly declare the great rights of mankind secured under this Constitution. So as hard fought as those amendments were, it is crucial to recognize that our citizens must continue to uphold their rights and responsibilities in order to secure prosperity for our representative democracy. We are privileged to be citizens of the greatest nation conceived upon earth, a position that entails commitment not only to ourselves, but to the citizens around us. And every individual is involved in, in our collective de destiny determines the outcome of a greater future. So that was, that was part of the, um, the essay I wrote. And uh, this past May, I got the chance to visit the headquarters of the National Capital Historical Society in Washington. Um, and I've uh, well, directed by, or led by the uh, director and the assistant director, I uh, received a tour of the Capitol. And I collected my uh, $500 award. And um, I think the bigger lesson I took away at the end of all of this is, is that my duty as a citizen extends not only to, to my nation, to my family members, to my community, but also to my neighbors on, uh, right up on Clark and Drive. So I'd like to thank everyone who was involved in this and everyone who supported this and the town for allowing me. You're so welcome Thanks. and congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Like congratulations.
Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Very soon. Very, very good. <laughs> What did she send me? Oh, my head's gonna explode. Oh, thanks, Mary Ellen. I'm in enough trouble. Oh, that's so cool. So next on our agenda, I have asked the police department, again, educational outreach, to give us a presentation on National Night Out. Good night, thank you. He wants to stay. So good evening, welcome. So, right, we're here to, we don't really do the full-blown National Night Out on the steps of Town Hall anymore, but we would still like the community to have some safety tips. Sure. Uh, okay, uh, real quick, uh, just start off with uh, National Night Out was a, uh, sponsored uh, by the National Association of Town uh, Watches. It's uh, pretty much America's Night. Excuse me. Excuse me. It's uh, pretty much America's Night Out Against uh, Crime. It was established back in 1984, and uh, it's pretty much a cooperation between the police department and members of the community to try to educate the public about crime, uh, things they can do to protect their, themselves and their neighborhoods, and not only uh, for us to work in conjunction, but also to send a message to criminals that you know the community cares and mm -hmm. we're involved and we want to put an end to it. Uh, some of the safety tips that I guess I have for you guys today are uh, uh, some of the things that are pretty much um, should be done on a regular basis. Uh, first and foremost always be aware of your surroundings. Uh, today's world everyone's too busy on their cell phones and occupied doing social media and uh, they're not paying attention to their surroundings. Uh, not only are they exposing their valuables to uh, criminals such as uh, iPhone or other mobile devices, um, they're not being aware of their surroundings. Uh, sometimes in the news you might hear people crossing the street and who gets hit by a car because they're too busy texting. They're in another world. Uh, that's one, first and foremost. Uh, keep doors locked, uh, your home, your car. Everything should be put away and make sure everything's uh, locked up. Do not leave any valuables in your car. Um, if you see any unusual activity in your neighborhood, always call the police. It's not a bother. Um, if you think it's something silly, it's not an issue. You can call and we will respond and check up on it. Uh, you can put timers on your inside lights if you're uh, going away uh, for a long weekend or on vacation. Uh, definitely contact uh, the post office or your neighbors to uh, pick up your mail. This way your mailbox is not overflown and criminals don't know that you are um, away on vacation. Uh, first and foremost, uh, touching back on the social media, uh, do not advertise that you are going away on vacation for two weeks uh, on social media because unfortunately uh, people have access to any all that information and you're just pretty much letting people with uh, bad intentions know that you're not going to be home for two weeks. Uh, keep that in mind when you are, are posting on social media. If you do have an alarm system, make sure you actually turn it on and set it. Uh, there's been plenty of times where people actually have it, but they uh, forget to set it or just don't want to be bothered by uh, putting in the code every single time they come in and out of the house. Uh, watch out for uh, scams, uh, deceptions. Uh, you have people coming up to you, uh, the house stating they work for some sort of utility company and uh, they need to come inside your house to check uh, whatever, the meter or your gas stove 
Um, and meanwhile, while that person is uh, distracting you, he or she has a partner who usually comes in through another entry point in your residence, and unfortunately you get burglarized and you become a victim of crime. Uh, so always uh, ask for ID. Uh, PSCNG, water company, whomever it is, cable company, they all carry ID. Make sure you ask for ID before you let anyone in your residence. Uh, do not leave valuables in your car. Uh, GPS, that's been around for a long time and people continue to do it. Uh, they forget it and they leave it plastered up on the windshield and that's just pretty much a freebie for anyone who's driving by or walking by and uh, is looking to make a quick $80, $100 or whatever it is. Uh, since the children are out for the summer, make sure you uh, Keep an eye out for kids playing in the streets. Kids usually run out, dart out in between cars. Uh, touching on children, uh, make sure your kids, if they are riding on a bike, uh, they are wearing a helmet. Bicycle safety is uh, crucial. Um, helmet will protect and save their lives. And uh, make sure you educate your children on um, making, how to make an emergency call, how to properly use 911, how to uh, Dial it, how to uh, pretty much know their address, know their phone number, their ad, uh, parents' contact information just in case they get lost. Uh, make sure you teach them uh, a password that's, I guess, uh, you know, if you have come across any strangers and, and teach them stranger danger. Uh, kids' safety uh, is very paramount uh, nowadays. Uh, usually, what we do in National Night Out is uh, hand out. Uh, flyers to the community on cycle safety, uh, safety on the web, stranger danger, uh, information on drugs, ID theft, uh, pedestrian safety, senior safety, and then teenage drinking and teenage uh, drug use. Uh, that's pretty much, I guess, what National Night Out is in a condensed version. Condensed version. And a lot of it, as you said, is really common sense. But Correct. I think we always need those reminders yes, because we are often distracted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And you brought material that you can leave with us here to get I out? have a lot of handouts. Okay. And uh, from whomever is in the meeting. Any questions? Comments? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Nicely thank done. You. Thank, thank you, you very much. How come, how come we don't do it on full scale anymore? Okay. The next thing on our agenda was an update from uh, our public inf information officer, which I did receive today. Um, right off the bat, the new outlook is online, www.westorange.org. Uh, there are copies in the li library calendar, upcoming months in town. Uh, plenty of pictures of residents at Inside. It says, see for yourself. The new outlook. Tuesday, August 19th. New Jersey Arts Incubator at, oh, this has been rescheduled. So this is Matilda, uh, the show, the outdoor show, uh, which was presently, uh, currently supposed to occur tonight, is rescheduled for August 19th because of the weather. Farmer's Market on the corner of Eagle Rock and Hazel Avenue, in um, Hazel Avenue, Harrison Avenue, sorry, in the Quigley parking lot. Everything from fresh fruits to veggies to gourmet bread. Baked goods, steak, fish, plenty more. And our new store in town on Valley Road, Pink Cupcakes, just joined. Um, and they've even added a jewelry vendor. So expanding nicely. Ginny Dunkel Pool, summer special discount pool packages are available from August 9th through Labor Day. Call 325-4150 for, <coughs> God bless you, for God bless details. You. Or visit www.westorange.org for pricing. We have a new West Orange community map where you can learn about the history of your neighborhood online, again, at westorange.org. Um, we actually got sustainable Jersey points for creating a community asset map. Uh, vote for West Orange in the Best of Essex Awards. Favorite restaurants, best stores, best doctors, and plenty more at www.suburbanessex.com. 
We still encourage everyone to shop local with Shop uh, West Orange car. You can pick up a card at the mayor's office, 973-325-4100, or through the, West Orange down, the downtown West Orange Alliance at 973-325-4109. Residents are encouraged to sign up for a very important code red emergency alert notification system. Notified and given up to date information in case there is an emergency in town. Again, visit the website at the bottom and left hand side to, of our township homepage to sign up. With summer storm season, PSENG has made it easier for customers to track the status of power outages using its online outage map. Learn more at the website, www.pseng.com. And coming soon, we have a couple events coming up. On September 14th, the Mayor's 5K Run, Break the Silence on Ovarian Cancer. We had that presentation at our Lance Council meeting. And the Stop for Nikhil, Run to Raise Traffic Safety Awareness. Anything else? Council Liaison Announcements. <clears throat> um, thank you, Council President. Say thank you for. You that, that's okay. No, thank you for bringing out the things of what they're doing at the farmers market, which is really um, it's getting great. Uh, you got to go down there and see it. The uh, the selection is wonderful. Uh, we also have to thank uh, John Menelotis from the Chronicle for donating ten sets of Legos so the kids can play with the Legos <laughs> while their parents are shopping. So thank you, John. We good really idea. appreciate that. Yeah, it was a very good idea. And thank you for mentioning about the Mayor's 5K Run for Cancer on 914. If you go to our website, you can. Uh, we like we need volunteers, so please uh, help us out and volunteer anytime that you can. We really would appreciate it. Um, so thank you, Council President. Thank you. Councilman? Yes, thank you. The West Orange Open Space Commission met this week and considered an offer uh, from a resident to purchase a small lot at 88 Valley Way near uh, Maple, and uh, the commission voted uh, not to. Uh, at the meeting, uh, we heard that Abe Bunis, who's uh, well known in town as a former Open Space Commission chair and a current member, is uh, is in the hospital and just uh, wanted everyone to know who uh, may not be getting their good gossip uh, in the dog days of August, but just wanted to let you know in case you wanted to contact him with a family. Uh, I also am on a much happier note, just wanted to let everyone know that there is an upcoming concert here in town that you may be interested in. Uh, Our Lady of Lords Church, which is at the intersection of Main Street and Eagle Rock Avenue is celebrating its 100th anniversary as a church and also the 50th anniversary of the church that's actually there. And uh, as part of that, they have uh, pulled together a, uh, an orchestral performance that's uh, by the Les Elgart Orchestra, Russ Dorsey, director, uh, and this they're going to be playing the hits of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. As some of you may know, uh, there was a priest at Our Lady of Lourdes who was a well-known composer of this time, composed over 300 popular standards uh, earlier in uh, the last century, uh, Father Joseph Pierre Norman Connor. We're having the concert in honor of him. The honorary chair of the event is Governor Brendan Byrne, who of course has deep roots in West Orange. And the co-chair is John Degnan, who also has West Orange roots, and is, you may recognize he's the new chair of the Port Authority. The event is going to be September 14th at 3 p.m. at Our Lady of Lords Church. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with music of the 30s and 40s but may not recognize uh, Father Connor's name, he, one of his most popular hits was The Miracle of the Bells that was actually turned into a film in 1948 starring Frank Sinatra. For more information or to purchase tickets, you can go to the church website, www.lords, L-O-U-R-D-E-S, westorange.org, or you can call the rectory at 973-325-0110. Thank you. Thank you. Council Ms. Rillen. Yes, Mr. President, thank you. Uh, we didn't meet at the uh, 
at the Degden House um, since the last meeting. Uh, but I do want to make an announcement. I do want to make an announcement uh, this Saturday uh, from 3 to 6 p.m. at Ridgeway, uh, Ridgeway Park. Um, there's going to be a, a community uh, gathering uh, of uh, residents, uh, neighborhood residents, and the whole community is invited to come look at the new park. Uh, it's passive recreation, as you know. Uh, open space uh, that we had, uh, that we were able to um, to invest in. Uh, so again, this Saturday from 3 to 6 p.m., uh, everyone's invited. Uh, bring the kids, uh, bring a lawn chair. Uh, there's going to be some music. It's going to be ice cream. Uh, and uh, just bring something to share in terms of food. Uh, everybody's bringing their own. So we we'll hope to see everyone there on Saturday. Thank you. Thank Councilman. you. Councilman. I have had no summer meetings this since our last meeting. Thank you. Just today, there was a ribbon cutting at 95 Northfield Avenue for the Zoo Fall Health Center. So we welcome the new business in town. The West Orange Arts Council, on the second Wednesday of every month, they meet at the West Orange Library. Uh, it's presented by Carol Lemon, West Orange artist. Uh, program is free for anyone to attend talk about art, discuss creative process and challenging face, uh, challenges facing artists today. And um, currently, there is an exhibit of photography and painting dis on display at the West Orange Library from West Orange artist Denise Smith. Beautiful work. The planning board met last Wednesday and um, we have three new businesses in town. At the old Blockbuster on Pleasant Valley Way, Blockbuster, then it was a wine store, that is going to be the next stage kidney care center. Uh, the owner of property RKS, we know as the care station. The proposal is to re replace the existing building, which is 40 years old, with a contemporary medical office building. The new building would be two stories, 8,000 square feet, and parking arranged uh, with almost 50 parking spaces at the care station. And I saved the best for last, Jersey Mike's up at the Whole Food Plaza, um, right behind Chipotle. So Jersey Mike's is coming to West Orange. Happy to report. And I would also like to invite everyone this Thursday, August 14th, here in Town Hall, we are having the ceremony to celebrate the independence of India. This would be our second annual, I think. Um, everyone is open, it's open to the public. Everyone's invited to attend. I forgot what time it is. I forgot what time it is. Do you know what time it is? It is 7.05. 7.05. No, no, the, 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 oh, <laughs> the event is at seven. <laughs> I'm sorry. What did I say? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll find out. Okay. Madam Clerk. This is to inform the general public that this meeting is being held in compliance with Section 5 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law, 1975. A notice of this meeting was mailed to the Star Ledger and the West Orange Chronicle on November 23, 2013. A notice of this meeting was also posted on the bulletin board in the Municipal Building, West Orange, and filed in the office of the Municipal Clerk of the Township of West Orange on November 23, 2013. Councilman Cirillo? Present. Councilman Garino? Present. Councilman Kokoviak? Present. Councilwoman Spango? Present. Council President McCartney? Present. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The council is now in their public meeting. So at this time, I would ask if anyone has a comment that they would like to make. Please come, state your name and address. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Claire Silvestri, 20 Grandview Avenue. I have some questions about a variety of issues tonight. 
at the last council meeting, there was a discussion about the, all the road work going on in town. And there were some questions about why the town replaced the sidewalks on Yale and Harvard terraces in the Gregory section at the same time it did road resurfacing and the curbs there. Mr. Lepore stated that the sidewalks were done on those streets because that specific project was funded by a state grant. However, I believe what wasn't mentioned was that the grant only covered about two-thirds of the total cost of this project and that an additional $118,000 of township funds were also spent. So if you use Mr. Lepore's calculation of an additional $50 to $60 per foot for sidewalks, conservatively speaking, it appears taxpayer money pretty much covered the cost to replace those sidewalks on those two streets. Is that correct? Also, Mr. Sayre said at the last meeting that the bids for construction work on the Valley Neighborhood Police Substation were, quote, a little bit higher, unquote, than originally budgeted. I went back and checked the list of projects provided to the public when the capital budget was approved by the council back in May, and I found that the bid of $325,000 approved for the substation is actually $200,000 over the capital budgeted amount of $150,000. Uh, uh, frankly, I'm amazed anyone would categorize $200,000 as only a little bit higher. Mr. Sayers also assured the council that there are funds in the capital budget to cover that larger amount. But I don't believe you can cover a sum of money that size just by relying on other projects to come in under budget. It's most likely that some other capital expenditures will have to be cut. And I'd like the administration to give us some idea of their plans in that regard. But I sincerely hope the capital funding for new wireless microphones in council chambers will not be one of the items cut. In fact, I'd strongly urge the administration to get working on replacing these mics as soon as possible. It's becoming increasingly difficult for the public to hear what's being said not only by council members, but in particular the comments of members of the administration in answer to questions, specifically Mr. Sayers and Mr. Gross. It's a problem for both the people listening here in chambers as well as those watching the videos at home. The council's been approving contracts in hundreds of thousands of dollars in recent meetings. Could the administration please provide us with the status of that particular $1,000 capital project? And finally, I have a question about Ordinance 2419-14 on first reading, which is on the feeding of wildlife in town. In reading the ordinance, it appears to me that the proposed change is meant to address a problem with feral cats. However, the language of the proposed change seems very broad. It reads, quote, no person shall feed any wildlife, excluding confined wildlife, anywhere within the township. Unquote. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't that effectively prohibit residents from having bird feeders on their property? And if approved, would that mean that even a hummingbird feeder would be illegal in our town? Um, I know I've asked quite a number of questions tonight, and I thank you in advance for the answers I expect will be provided. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, close public comment. Portion of our meeting. Um, Claire, I'm not sure with the comment that you just made if you're criticizing Jack's comment or are you criticizing the investment in the substation project? Because I think it is a worthwhile investment to, um, for the project on uh, Valley Road to protect the businesses on that in that corridor. Um, it was really a rhetorical question, but I didn't mean for you to come back. I'm, I'm sorry, the point I'm trying to make is that but in the interest of transparency, Mr. Sears did never, never said, he said a little bit higher, twice. And $200,000 isn't a little bit. You're absolutely um, and that's the point I was trying to make, okay. that it was, it was portrayed differently. Um, just in the interest of transparency, it would be nice for, for, for uh, residents to understand how much it's actually costing. And I, I just, I can't imagine that, that the, uh, I know it's a large capital budget, but $200,000 is not easily covered someplace else. 
And I, I know that you, Council President, asked the question at the last meeting, do we have enough funds? And it was said yes. Um, but I think it's, it's incumbent to explain to the public and not, you know, $200,000 more on a project is, uh, is not something small that can just be covered. Okay. And how are they going to do that? Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to get up and speak okay. again. Council President, can I respond? Yes, sir. Of course. Um, I'm not sure whether I said a little more or it was more than we had expected, Regardless. but I'm not so sure what my language was, but I'm not going to debate that. The bottom line is we have no control over a project when it's bid. When we put out a bid, that's the law in the state of New Jersey, and when the bids come back, we have to deal with those bids. The bids absolutely came in higher than we had anticipated. And unfortunately, we're going to fund, unfortunately, the bids came in higher and we are going to fund this project because the people in the valley want the project. Now, to answer uh, Mrs. Silvestri's second question about the additional monies, there's going to be no monies, there's going to be no capital projects that are going to be cut to fund this project. Um, Mr. Gross could probably address this a little bit better than I can, but there is additional monies that we have in the budget that we're going to fund this project with those additional monies. And uh, the bottom line is there will be absolutely no capital projects cut to fund that project. Great. Thank you. John, anything else to add? Uh, no, nothing any more than to, to echo uh, uh, the business administrator's point that we, we found uh, funding. We, we found funding in, in old capital where we were able to utilize for this project. Any other comments on that? Uh, comment. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council President. I just wanted to ask the question because I, I was the one that brought this up about the work at uh, Yale and Harvard and just pointed out that, uh, that we typically don't do work on the sidewalks. It's under our ordinances. It's the responsibility of the property owners. But that sounds like a very large number. And I know Mr. Lepore is on vacation now, but perhaps somewhere between now and the next council meeting, could, could uh, you provide the council just with a number of sure. how much the sidewalks cost, just so we can, can clarify? Okay, thank you. Any other comment? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Consent agenda approval of minutes of previous meeting, public meeting July 22nd, 2014. Consent. Report of township officers, none. Reading of petitions and communications and bids, none. Bills, are there any questions on the bills? Consent. Consent. Resolutions, are any resolutions being pulled this evening? I did have a question on uh, resolution 142-14. I, I had questioned if, that should, if we should have an executive session. This is a resolution um, authorizing our zoning board attorney to defend um, the zoning board. Uh, apparently there was a zoning board application and it was denied and uh, now it has to be, uh, they, the applicant is appealing the application, uh, the decision. Um, so we do not need to go into executive session, right, because it was an open public meeting. Right. Okay. I don't have anything else. Councilwoman. I just have a question for the administration. If you could just explain. Resolution 155.14 says it's for you to lease two police interceptors. And then 158 and 159 is to purchase. Could you just explain like why we lease and or purchase? Like why do we purchase and then why do we also lease? Uh, we have we have traditionally gone through lease purchase of police vehicles. I remember that um, with all of our police vehicles. Um, it, it is a common um, financing method that allows you to uh, amortize the use of the vehicles over over the three years uh, of a useful life of a police car, as opposed to paying for it all the first year and then using them the next year. That's the first, that's that's the reason. So you do a lease, and at the end, there's a it's, it's a dollar buy-in. So it's, it's it's a financing mechanism. The reason that you're asking, reason that we're having um, really three resolutions here in reference right. to these vehicles, is we're doing something different this year than uh, we've done in the, in the past. 
In the past, we have done leases. We've purchased the vehicles through state contract or through a co-op and then leased the vehicles through the manufacturer through their leasing program. Um, we, we took a look at that and have always believed that, I've always believed that that was a very expensive way to go. And in fact, uh, we were able to secure financing through another co-op at approximately half the rate uh, that the, the uh, well, that was my the, other the manufacturers question. were offering us. So this is actually, the first two resolutions are um, resolutions authorizing us to use the financing through the Middlesex Educational right. Co-op. Um, and, and, and it's broken into two resolutions because there's a dollar maximum of 100000 in order to do this kind of a, of a project. So we're, instead of being locked out of it, we're doing two resolutions. We're able to do, do basically do two deals. Um, and then the third resolution after that is actually authorizing the, the Middlesex Educational Co-op to actually purchase on our behalf from the uh, Morris County Co-op the vehicles. So it gets a little it, it's a little that, convoluted, but but it, but it, it's it, they're all part parts of the same. But that was my next question. Why is why is there a purchase of four through Morris County Co-op and then purchase three through the state contract? No, oh, no, it's actually four. There's there's oh. two and two, total of four. There's two there's two in each resolution through the for the. But the, like, why the two different? They're places? the same vehicles. These are, in other words, we have two resolutions uh -huh. authorizing the financing mechanism okay. for four vehicles. It happens to be two different I deals we had to do because of the because of the dollar amounts, and then the, the third resolution is where we're directing them and authorizing them to buy the vehicles we want. For, through the financing of the Middlesex, Essex, uh, Middlesex Educational Co-op. Okay. They're basically the GMAC or the Ford Motor Credit. So if you take those two, they're doing the financing, and the third resident, we're telling them what to buy for us. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I just wanted to follow up on that as long as we're on the subject. I think part of the complication may be that we actually uh, provide the funding initially and then get the funding back no that's not is that not how not we do it? there's a resolution tonight the resolution that you're talking about the, for the the actual purchase there's a, an amendment on your desk tonight yes. uh because they, there was a um a whereas clause there which was a traditional whereas clause where we were buying it we amended that to basically that we're going to be um we're authorizing the middlesex educational co-op to buy on our behalf so that we're not we're not financing both sides okay of it. So this was actually the one that I pulled, I sort of flagged in, a, in the questions. And now the, the, the version that we got tonight is corrected. The version you have tonight has that. The, the, way, it was, the way it was written was confusing. We, we agreed with you that it was confusing. Uh, so therefore, we, we clarified it. Because we could have taken the position with the, the previous wording that, that we're, we're issuing a order to purchase as opposed to a purchase order. But, we, we figured it was better to just to clean it up. Was this the one that had the two different numbers in it that I flagged, or was that one of the other? Because these numbers are now identical, and I thought I thought they were a that, little bit that different. That may have been the case. I did tell you okay. the truth. I didn't look at that. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Not being called. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Councilman? Councilman. Well, yes, if I could, please. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, the first. Uh, question is about resolution 145-14 resolution directing the undertaking of a continuing disclosure review and authorizing participation in the municipality's continuing disclosure cooperation initiative of the division of the u.s securities and exchange commission uh, and mr gross and i have been having some back and forth uh, just essentially and correct me when i go off the rails but the uh, securities and exchange commission is making an effort to try to more or less clean up uh, the issue that's been going on for years and years in the municipal bond market where in the aftermarket uh, municipal issuers and underwriters are supposed to provide continuing information uh, similar to the stock market to give investors uh, all the information they need to decide whether to buy or sell the bonds. And uh, what they're doing here is actually uh, putting together a uh, a mitigation program in which if you self-report any problems that you had, then the SEC won't come down on you nearly as hard. So I, 
this raised my flag because I wanted to see if it was something that we knew, something that we had uh, we needed to fix. You said no, we don't know. Yeah, We're not me, aware of any issues right let, now. Let me maybe. Just, there you go. Just you let me talk way too long. Span a little bit on that. Um, <laughs> the, the historically. Uh, the, even though there were rules and regulations regarding self-reporting, um, the, the SEC has not enforced that on municipalities because investors, quite frankly, um, were quite satisfied that you know, municipal bonds were such a secure investment that they really was no pressure to do that, uh, that enforcement. Uh, I guess with the advent of you know, recent times in the city of Detroit and you know, the, the um, Security and Exchange Commission was under pressure to start doing enforcement. So what they decided to do was rather than go out and, and basically um, do uh, and spend the money and researching to see who was in violation and who was not in violation, uh, they came up with a plan that everyone uh, that was, all municipalities that were out there could uh, apply for this program and go do their own research and report back and if you reported back whatever, whatever sins there may be, and these sins could go back 20, 30 years, quite frankly, um, whatever, whatever they may be, you find them, you correct them, and then the SEC would not take any action against those municipalities. So we're, we're, we're the, the, the prudent thing, and we got, a, we got a local finance notice on this recently, the prudent thing is to do is to sign up for it, uh, in the process, then then move forward and do your research and find out if you have any issues. If we have no issues, then we'll re we'll report that we have no issues and we'll, we'll move forward. If we do have issues, we'll solve them uh, and report that, and hopefully that will solve uh, any issues moving forward. So we, we've we've engaged a firm uh, on advice from our uh, from council. It's a, uh, a national company uh, to take a look at our our filings and do a review for us. It's costing us about $4,000 total this year. And then moving forward, it'll cost us about $1,500 a year for them to check every year and make sure that we're in filings because it's really important that we do because if we don't, um, the potential damage is, is that, we, that the township could, be, um, could have charges filed against it for uh, fraud, for not, not properly representing the financial situation. So the, these are, the, and, and just, just to give you an idea of what this stuff is, it's filing your audits, it's filing your budgets every year, it's filing certain um, operational information. Uh, pretty dry stuff, but important to investors. And it's, you know, in, 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 if you missed one little piece of it, um, you could be, you know, you, you could be technically in violation. So this is pretty much housekeeping, you know, and I know we use that word from time to time. But it, it, it is really that is it's going back and taking a look. And, you know, we have five bond issues out there that we're con that, that we have to be concerned about. We have to make sure that we've done everything that we're supposed to do over the past 20 years or so. Um, and if we haven't, then we'll clean that up. And then moving forward, we have a, a service in place to make sure that that, that you know nothing slips through the cracks. So it's a pretty small investment for a big return. And that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. Who's the firm that's been retained to do this workforce? It's a company called DAC. They're very well known uh, within the industry. Uh, uh, our, our council recommended them to me, basically saying there's other firms that are out there to do that. But the SEC is very familiar with this company, and the, the thought process was that if we uh, used them, the SEC, SEC would have a lot of respect for the, for the outcome, whereas we could hire local companies to do it and you know the, the concern where was well they may do a very good job but you know we, we're, we're hoping that when they see DAC has done it that that'll that'll be okay check and move on as opposed to potentially any other issues so um, again and because the cost is relatively low uh, we were able to I move forward and, and engage them and they're working on it now is that anything that has to come before the council, either the a contract or these actual no, for it's, approval? No, it's, it's below thresholds, below all thresholds, so. Okay. John, how were these filings handled prior to this? I'm sorry? How was this handled prior to this being put in place? Well, this never, the SEC never raised the issue. You know, they never it, really It was always pursued. done, they were always filed. I mean, but but not, there was a requirement for filing. Right. But they never did checks. There was never, never okay. any, any issues because Municipal, municipal bonds were such a secure, no, but nobody ever lost a dime on municipal bonds. Well, now that has changed now. You know, there, there, there are now be, beginning to be some, you know, failures. They're far and few between. Certainly nothing in the state of New Jersey. The state of New Jersey's county is so, 
you know, uh, meticulous and um, conservative, that the chances of something like that happening in this state are, I think, are about, you know, infinitesimal. That notwithstanding, the SEC is basically saying, you know, guys, we, we you know, we've let you go on this uh, because you were safe, but now we, now we have to tighten things up so that you're just like the rest of the market. They're no stronger than us than they are on the the, uh, the corporate bond market. It's now we, we have the same responsibilities that they. Have. May I ask a question? If, if I could just follow up one more question, just, just to say, the, <laughs> the issue with the dis dis continued disclosure is nobody pays attention until the bonds aren't paid back, and then by by the time we realize that the bonds can't be paid back for whatever reason, I mean the. Uh, Birmingham is another huge mess. By the time you find out that they can't be paid back, it's too late to fix anything. Whereas if you had the continuing right. disclosure and, and, and was factual. If the Not that that's the situation here. Right. But. right. If the continuing disclosure were out there, those people that bought those bonds, at least, you know, they had the opportunity to make a, an informed decision to, about the risks of their funds. Whether without the, dis, the continued disclosure, they're, they're basically flying blind. Yes. So therefore, that's why it's an issue. You're, right. you're and the issue is transparency. So that's what this is designed for. So thank you. Go. Thank, no, thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Gross, how far back are they going to go? Uh, we're going to go far. We, we have our earliest issue is 2003. Uh, so they'll probably look go back um, probably five years before that, just you know to make sure that you know to see to tell us what we've done from that point forward. Um, but it, you know, we, like I said, we have five bond issues that it's a, that the consideration. And it's, it's interesting. It's not what you, it's not so much what you do afterwards. It's what you did before, right. before the, you know, because you have an obligation to re, to continue to report. So it's it, it the, the, there's a look back period, not necessarily a look forward period. You can always cure. You can't always cure something back because when you bought the, when you sold the bonds, you had to be in compliance when because that, that's the fraud. There's a statement in your when you sell a bond that you are in compliance and you have with all your issues and that's the, that's the that's the point of con potential fraud if you if you certify that you're in compliance and indeed you weren't on the, the date of the sale of that bond that's that's the key issue okay and just briefly that what are the mechanics for doing this of, of filing no well, what this company is going to do for us to look back at our, at our filings all that oh well they're already started i had a, a phone conference with them today um they've set up a site they basically want, they're looking at all of our bond issues they're looking at uh with you know they they they, they read and, and and look at what our obligations for continued disclosure are they set up they've set up a website with which identifies everything we were supposed to have done now they're going back and researching to see what we did do and see if there's any any deficiencies if it comes out that there's there's no deficiencies, then this is this was an exercise that we will not pull the trigger on. You know, you're authorizing us to go into this program. If we find that we don't need to, then we don't need to. If we find that we do, if there's some flaw back in, you know, 98 or 2002 or 2011, you know, when, when, whatever, um, then we will be able to. This program allows us to solve that flaw and and hopefully be in no uh, have have nothing come from that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Council President, I'd like to uh, pull Resolution 141-14, authorizing the adoption of the 2014 Essex County Multi-Jurisdictional All-Hazards Mitigation Plan Update. Also, uh, Agenda Item J, Resolution 150-14, Resolution authorizing an eighth extension of TV Consultation Services Agreement to meet state-mandated services with the New Jersey Medical School Global Tuberculosis Institute at Rutgers. And uh, the last poll I wanted to do was for agenda item K, which is resolution 151-14, a resolution authorizing the mayor to sign an agreement with MetLife to provide certain insurance coverage to full-time township employees at no cost to the township. And b before I yield the floor, I just wanted to bring up something. I don't know if everyone has had a chance to look at their emails today, uh, but I do want to raise this issue because I, I think it needs to be addressed by the council and the administration going forward, and it has to do with the issue of how council people get information uh, to answer their questions uh, on council meeting agendas. And uh, in the last few council meetings, I have been getting some of the, my answers and uh, materials uh, sometimes as little as a half an hour before the start of the council meeting, most of the time within a, a few hours of the council meeting. And I just raised this issue on an email I sent around midnight on between Sunday and Monday. And I just ask that, uh, that the responses from the various people I send the questions to be forwarded to me as soon as possible 
and not held until more or all of the responses are delivered to the chief financial officer, who then sends them all to me. Uh, because much of the information gets delivered to me within a few hours of the start of the council meeting conference agenda, it's more helpful to me to have longer to review and consider the responses. On uh, Monday, uh, yesterday, the uh, police chief sent an email around to. So I guess, I'm going to have to. I want to interrupt because this isn't on our agenda, and I'm well, trying to get it on the agenda. I will, right? And I'm trying to help you because if you recall, when we changed the format of our agenda um, we were doing a work session and we haven't had really one and if that is a topic that we would like to discuss we can have the chief uh, the administration here to vet that out if you want to put that on the agenda for possibly the next council meeting we can have a work session which would come after our meeting and have that discussion that, that would be that would be wonderful but I do want to finish my comments before we move on if I could please that wouldn't be fair I'm sorry. Uh, I, I really would. It's, it's not something that I believe that you can take away from me. I, I'm, I'm already going through this and I'd like to continue. Okay, that's why we have ordinances in place. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Uh, so the police chief sent me an email. It said, Dear Joe, you have requested eight entities, be they departments or individuals, to answer approximately 55 questions within 24 hours as it relates to 17 different resolutions ordinances without regard to whom is to answer what nor have you attached any relevant contracts or supporting documents which may or may not be necessary to provide an intelligible response to your many explorations. Going forward, would you be so kind as to delineate by resolution ordinance from whom you would like each answer and direct such inquiries directly to Jack as the business administrator and myself as the director of staff operations with a copy to the mayor and CFO? This, I believe, is consistent with the intent of the Faulkner Act Plan B and maintains established, clear lines of authority. I don't like to make assumptions, and from a management perspective, this would help to streamline and avoid a duplication of effort on the part of the above addressed recipients, as more often than not, there are some interdepartment overlaps. By way of example, the police department are the end users of police cars. Vehicles are budgeted and specified by DPW slash engineering with input from police staff, bid by purchasing and authorized by the CFO. This for all intents and purposes can lead to multiple members of the administration performing identical tasks in an effort to accommodate but one of your numerous requests. Given the operational budget of most organizations, yes, be Porter, they Porter. government and corporate typically exceeding 90% S&W, I'm confident you will agree that the foregoing methodology currently, employs, currently employed is pennywise and pound foolish, as it may in certain circumstances potentially cost more tax dollars through duplication of effort than those idyllic, idyllically sought to be saved. Of further concerns are your directions to the various recipients indicating how you now wish to have this information presented to you independently rather than streamlined through the CFO, which is in direct contradiction to the current protocol in place explicitly established by the BA with the mayor's imprimatur as CEO of the township. I'm understanding of your desire to obtain and digest the information sought in advance of council meetings. However, I'm equally hopeful you too are understanding of the frustrations experienced by department executives when they are the recipients of conflicting directions from two distinct branches of government and unintended consequence, I'm certain. To be clear, it is my purpose here only to help, not hinder, your endeavors. So in the future, if you would be considerate of the foregoing imposed to Jack as the business administrator and myself as the director of staff operations with a copy to the mayor and CFO, any questions, comments, or concerns, including but not limited to township council meeting agendas, instruct your legislative staff in the clerk's office to attach not only the agenda, but any and all necessary documents required to answer your inquiries, you will have my personal commitment that we will have to privilege. have our executive staff. I understand that. And I, I ask understand that, that. We be respectful to the public, be respectful to the audience uh, who is here to listen to us debate the people's business as opposed to reading an email that could be posted anywhere. And, uh, I, would ask, I would ask that you be respectful to me I'm, and I'm, allow I'm, me I'm, to I'm, speak. Through the you, council president. We already did Sir. that. Right. You've tried to interrupt me twice. I would appreciate it if you'd be it's quiet. I would appreciate if you'd be quiet so I can... Gentlemen, gentlemen. This right. is directly the related to me. The public is out here to, to, to see us through the people's business. Okay? The
public out there, we're here to do that. There's an agenda Councilman, for today. Councilman, and I, and, and I've Councilman, already stated that. I, I've already respectful stated Respectful to that. my colleagues, respectful to the public out there, I, I, I think we should stick to the agenda for tonight. Should my colleague feel a need to discuss this issue, perhaps at the end of the meeting, we can discuss this matter. Councilman, you were sitting right there when I already said that this sounds like it's between Councilman Krakowiak and the police officer, and I mean the chief. Um, so it, it does not to do need to be on the agenda. It, it does do not. This is personal. And it has and directly I'm not to putting do. it on the agenda for our work session because you will have to talk to the chief about that. Okay. So, and so I'll finish you took it with your yourself. leave, please. Instruct your legislative staff and the mm -hmm. clerk's office to attach not only the agenda, but any and all necessary documents required to answer your inquiries. You will have my personal commitment that we will have our executive staff here in the administration provide the appropriate responses as expeditiously as humanly possible to jack me and subsequently on to you through the CFO consistent with the mayor's unambiguous directions. Thank you in advance for your anticipated cooperation. Best Jimmy. So I wrote today. Oh, Chief, we're not. We're I not. share your Council frustration President, with the current process, but I reject your proposed solutions as even more burdensome okay. on the council. The detailed, please, let no, me finish. No, please, no. We're done. Okay. okay. We are done. You are reading an email between you and the director of operations. It has to do with all of us. It doesn't how have anything to do with no, me. How we don't get? I don't want to just finish talking. Speak. Don't need you to speak I, for my we part. don't have to speak this at all. This goes to the heart of how it we doesn't. get information to do our job. You seem to have a Let problem with the information. You an that you, I don't I want her. I the, don't the first, want. An if example. I could just finish, please stop interrupting no, me, and I'll stop interrupting you. I'm not. I'm sorry. This is this is an issue you have with the director and the administration, not with your colleagues. I don't have that issue. I get my package, I get my mail, I read my mail, I make my phone calls, and I get questions answered. So I don't know why you have that problem. So why is it do you think that I have problems getting information as recently as less why. than half an hour well, before the I meeting? Well, I think, well, I don't know. I don't read your all of your emails, but because your questions have more to do with administrative decisions than your role as a councilman. I think that's why. So I, that's what I don't think, those are not the issues. The issues you raise are not the decisions that we have to make. The decisions that they have to put on our agenda, the administration puts on our agenda. We, They're not. We as council people have a requirement to do due you're diligence. You're absolutely if right. If your approach to due diligence is different from mine, it is. Are it you has say, been. Uh, yes, but does it that mean been. that I can't perform my due diligence so that I can make informed decisions not at for all. the council? Not at all. And you can write your questions. You certainly and, can. And that's what I've done. And I'm. And getting the chief them later is giving you the later. protocol on right. how to do it. Right. And you is, are rejecting the police's. How do you know that? Because you just read it. <laughs> You, you, just, you stopped me from reading my response. You just said, I reject your proposal. Isn't that what you're saying? That's right. Is? There you go. So you just said it. And then you interrupted me before I could finish my email. That's right. Does so that, mean that is between. Me no, now? it means that you have this issue with the police, with the chief of operations, and that's where it needs to go. Not here. Not on our agenda. And you did say you're going to put this on the agenda for the next meeting. Is I'm not correct? now because you just read the whole thing. There's nothing left to discuss. Because you disagree with the police, we have to discuss your issue. We don't. Disagree with the police? Well, with the this chief. This isn't even a police matter. I didn't mean the police. I meant the police chief who is the working as a director. That's fine. Then, then I, I hope if you're not going to allow me to try to address this with the council because it goes to the very heart of how we get information from the administration so that we can make, so that we can make informed decisions right, on we this. Go. Well, I'll I, just tell you, you're I, asking I do, for I legislative history. We have legislative history on all of our ordinances. We have how many pages of documentation on resolutions. I have plenty of information. I have so, plenty of information to make my decisions. So please just let me finish my, it'll only take another 45 Wait, to 60 would seconds. Wait, what do you want to finish? The fact that you reject I want to finish the email that what? you originally let me speak. No, but you don't need to finish it because all it is is saying that you disagree with the protocol that's in place. So that's something that you have to work out between the director of application of operations and the administration, not with us at a public council meeting. It's not an issue. It's your issue. You work out how you want to receive your information and what you what information you want to get. 
I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues, and I don't, um, you can speak for yourselves, but I don't think that that's, I don't have any problem with the information that I get. It's plenty. And if I have questions, I ask my questions. It's usually in a phone call, not 55 questions. So now you're telling me I'm asking too much questions? Too not, many questions? You, are, you can never ask enough questions. You can never ask enough questions. No. You can ask as many questions as you like. What you're saying is that you don't agree with the protocol of what's already in place, and that's what you want to change. And I don't think my colleagues should either. If you'll let me finish, I'll explain to you why I think all of us should be, con should be considering this as a council. Council President, you please can I, allow yes, me. Sir, please. Can I just make no. a statement? Yes, sir. Uh, if you recall, back in uh, September of 2013, we had a very large debate amongst this council and passed a new ordinance on how information was going to be disseminated by the administration. We follow that ordinance. No, that's what I just and now to. we're coming back and we want to change this ordinance again. I'm just not so sure what we need to continue to keep changing. Um, this ordinance was voted on and finalized a 5-0 vote by every person on this council and spells out exactly how information is to be disseminated. So I don't know what we're debating here or arguing or discussing here, but we already have a protocol and we changed this back in September. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I know. And That's what I just we follow to. this protocol. The bottom line is that when we, we get information, we disseminate it as quickly as, as we possibly can. There are not people in this building who just sit around all day and do nothing. We have things that have to get done. So when we get information, we get it out as quickly as possible. And as you said, the majority of the council people call, ask the questions they want to ask. Most of the information that's asked in the questions are already in the resolutions or in the ordinances, mm -hmm. and we clarify those answers. And we have no problem doing that because that's a much quicker way to do it than what Councilman Krakowiak is asking. If I could respond to Mr. Sayers. Sure. First of all, uh, what we're talking about now, what the police chief talked about now, is changing the protocol that has been in place. And he's doing that not by changing the ordinance, but by directing it to me and to, I think, 24 other people, both in the council and in the administration. So when you say that we already have an ordinance in place, I what the police, excuse me for interrupting, could I just I finish, could I just finish please? Sure, go ahead. What we're talking about now is changing the protocol. No, we're not. Without, please, please stop interrupting me. What we're talking about is changing the protocol of what has been in place for months, if not years. For example, uh, the police chief was not the director of special operations in September of 2013 when That's the ordinance is turned. It was changed. And now he's coming in and saying that. So if you think that we should readdress the ordinance, that's fine with me. But that's the issue I'm trying to raise. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. Your email said that you wanted people to directly respond to you. And what he said was it should go through the administration and then get to you. You're the one who made that statement in your first email to the police chief. Or to us, I should say. Not to the police chief, to the administration. This ordinance doesn't say that. It says it goes through the administration and the, and the information will be disseminated to you. That's fine. Council people should not be dealing directly with directors and employees in their departments. You are a legislative branch of government. We are the administration. You can laugh all you want, but this is the law. We're the administrative branch of government. And when he quotes Faulkner Act B government, maybe you should read that and understand what that means. Okay? And all he, all that, all the... Back and forth that you two guys had over the last two days had to do with one reason and one reason only. And that was you sending an email saying you wanted directors to respond directly to you. And that cannot happen. And that will not happen in this administration. Then that's fine. But let, that's, me, just, let, let me just say. But that's the issue. Please, could I just. Uh, sure. Go ahead. The process that has been in place for the last few years has been, uh, I guess, changed when Mr. Bruce came in. And what was happening is. Everybody was responding, they were responding to Mr. Gross, and Mr. Gross is sending me everything, and I mean everything, as recently as, as, as less than half an hour before the meeting, or, but more typically a couple of hours before the meeting starts. And I find that to be very difficult for me to uh, have the information and understand it so that I know going forward at the council meeting whether I need to bring up issues at the council meeting. 
And I see it as an, a situation where it actually saves a lot of time because if, once I get the information, I don't have to raise it at the council meeting. What? I, I agree with that. But what would be the problem for you to pick up the phone and call and say, I have some questions I'd like to get answered. Could you get me the answers to the questions? And then we get you the answers to the questions like everybody else does. But we get, we get an email from you, as the chief said, with 50, 60 questions on Monday, the day before the council meeting, that you want answered. And not, not only do you want them answered, but then you want our staff to put together graphs and charts for you. That, that's, not, that's not looking for information. That's asking the administration to do research for you. And that's something you should be doing as the council person, your own research. We should give you the documents. I have no problem with that. Give you the documents, take them and read them. But we're not, we're not supposed to be sitting here doing the research. That's the issue. And, and the issue really is more so that you want to go directly to the directors to get the information rather than having it come through the administration. No, that's incorrect. That's I just want the information. Said, Councilman. That's, 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 that's not what your email said. I have a copy of it. That's not what it said. And you know what? If the council president would let me read it, you can see, no, and response. everybody can understand not how I responded. Response. Your original email that came in. So I don't, I don't care where the information comes from. The point I'm making is I'm not getting the information in enough time ahead of the meeting to be able to utilize it. So I asked if they send the information to Mr. Gross, and Mr. Gross holds on to it however long he has to hold on to it until he sends it all at the same time, if I could get half of the emails on Monday or if I could get half, a quarter of the emails on the, the previous Friday, or if we could move back the time when we get the council meeting material, which is on Thursday afternoon, Let me ask you or if question. we can move it back to give us all more time, that would give the administration more time to answer the questions, and it would give me more time and the rest of the council people to have more time to understand Nobody what's going on. Nobody else is complaining about this but you. The, oh, the other four council people are very happy with the way they get their information. Be that as it may, the interesting thing to me is then you ask us questions on resolutions that have been on this agenda for two weeks and in this case actually on this agenda when was our last meeting three four weeks ago ordinances we had a meeting a month ago and you're asking us questions on monday about that ordinance that you already had a month ago so why didn't if you had questions about that why didn't you ask us those questions two weeks ago or we, you, you laugh every time I make a statement, but I'm trying to figure that out. Why would you not ask us those questions two weeks ago when you had that ordinance over a month ago? Right, and if it occurred to me to ask the questions, then I would have. Okay. But you just suggested that okay. I, I put my list of questions together and then I call. Who should I call? You should call me and say, and I, I should... have questions about specific things. I need to get answered and we'll discuss them with you. That's, that's what everybody else that's does. What we so so if you, you, you're throwing out the number of 50 questions. I don't know how many questions asked. So I'm supposed I to call. I didn't throw any numbers out. You read that. I didn't say anything. So, so I'm supposed to call you up with my list of the 50 questions and go through the 50 questions with you? Every other council person speaks to us about things that they need to clarify. As a matter of fact, when you look at your questions today, you, three of your questions ask the same questions about the same material. All three of them about the same material. I, I mean, it's, if it, I, you want to submit the questions, I have no problem with it. All I'm saying is, is if you're going to submit the questions, they should come to us, we will distribute them, the answers will come back to us, and Mr. Gross will get them back out to you. As per the ordinance that we passed back in September, which we all debated, if you recall, for a very long time, and everybody was happy with this. You're smiling again, but you voted for this too. This is how we distribute the information. We have to work by rules and regulations. We can't just willy-nilly say, today we're going to do it this way and tomorrow we're going to do it that way. We work by rules and regulations. So if the police chief says I should send the email to him, that means I sh I, that's a new interruption no, in the process. If you want to talk about this, <laughs> you can give me a call and we, you can sit down with me and we can discuss how we can do this in a better way for you. I mean that. Give me a call, come to my office, we'll sit down and figure out how we can better serve you and get you the information you need. I have no problem with that. But I don't think we should be debating it right out here in public. Yes, neither do I. Okay. Okay, thank you. Is anyone else Any calling the resolutions? resolutions? Or... Okay. okay. Nope. 
Okay, so with the exception of resolutions 141-14, 150-14, and 151-14, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The consent agenda is implemented. Okay, so resolution 141-14, Councilman Kokoviak, you pulled that? Yes, thank you. This is a resolution of the Township Council of the Township of West Orange authorizing the adoption of the 2014 Essex County Multi-Jurisdictional All-Hazards Mitigation Plan update. What we got in the packet does not contain the update or the plan. I requested the plan so I would know what I would be asked to approve. It says, now therefore be it resolved that the Township of West Orange adopts in its entirety the 2014 Essex County Multi-Jurisdictional All Hazards Mitigation Plan Update, the plan, as the jurisdiction's National Hazard, Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan and resolves to execute the actions identified in the plan that pertain to this jurisdiction. So I asked uh, in my questions and I said, please send the plan, preferably a link to the document online. Mr. Gross answered, Chief Smeraldo will be supplying the township's update submission. So we're being asked to approve a plan to be implemented in the town, and I don't know if my council colleagues have seen it, but I certainly have seen it. I've requested it. I haven't gotten it. So I just wanted to know what the plan is. The chief is here. The chief is here. Chief. The chief actually did, so I, I found it. He, he did send out the, uh, the information to us late, late this afternoon, which I did not see until I sat down here tonight. So we can send that to you, what we submitted. But just to be clear what this is, this is a, is a county plan where we, we, which, has been a, which has been adopted previously. And the chief, our, the, the, our, the chief as, in his role as OEM coordinator, has made his recommendations for the, the West Orange update and from a professional point of view as to what to be updated in that plan. And all this does is, is, is endorse the chief's uh, uh, submission and then adoption of the, the entire plan. Um, so I'll turn it over to the chief from there. Um, the Essex County Hazard Mitigation Program is actually a large uh, program that belongs to the state OEM um, and it actually ultimately goes up to FEMA. What this hazard mitigation plan is a day-to-day -day operation and a plan that we as a county will come together in response very similar to what I, um, we had passed a few weeks ago with the fire mutual aid program. It just happens to deal with the all hazard mitigations whether it be um, you know storms, uh, emergencies, water, uh, water uh, issues, things, anything that we could face as, as, as a community as a whole or as a county as a whole. And it's, it's a plan that every one of us have identified in our own respective municipalities of, of possible plans or, or emergencies that we could have in the next several years, what we anticipate, and potential projects that we can do to mitigate these, these uh, uh, potential uh, disasters or local emergencies by having a plan in place and then this gets forward to FEMA and then collectively if we are able to uh, get our plan substantiated they will fund it for us and, and hopefully get this, this particular either actual or possible hazards mitigated in advance. That's really what it comes down to. This plan is typically I believe it's either every four or five years that they, they update this plan. This plan was actually overdue in our county and we've been working on it. I actually sit on the committee with several other key people throughout the county and we've been steering this project to the point where hopefully that some of the projects we've identified through with our, our engineer Mr. Lepore and members of our OEM staff that we will receive funding in the future to help offset these costs and, and these plans will get, um, get come to fruition. Pete, can you just give us an example of a preventative measure strategy that you're discussing? Like just uh, one of them would be what right now what we have was I believe Nestro or Mayfair where we have uh, where we have all the piping and all that. Sure. That's that's an uh, that's a, um, um, a an idea of a plan. Okay. Um, we've identified and I I'd have to look this. I actually printed a copy so I can give it to the councilman if you want. And I, this is only one. This is only our draft, and I could get other copies. I could send it to you, but. 
I brought one here tonight. We've identified some areas in town, I believe, like such as well, the, uh, the Peckman River and the Wigwam Brook and things of that nature where we're going to try and, and we're, we're really more worried about flood. Mm -hmm. And we're also worried about a lot of our wires. Um, you know, obviously we know from Hurricane Sandy how many wires and how much outages we had. And uh, what we're looking to do is get some kind of plans in place that hopefully will help us um, not see those same kind of delays of outages and, and, um, and, dis and property destruction that we, we experienced in the past. That's what we're looking to do with this plan. This is a draft right now. Mm -hmm. The way this works, this process, this has been going on for over a year now, this, this particular plan. Uh, we've met several times throughout the, uh, the last 9, 12 months or whatever. And um, right now we're in the draft stage. We have it to the point where we've submitted to the state. It's going to get approved. It has to go to FEMA for approval. But part of this is that we have to get this resolution in place that, that as, a, as a municipality, we agree to this particular plan. And uh, we, we, we um, you as a, as, a, uh, as a body say, yes, we're going to go forward with this plan. And that's really what it comes down to. So you're really looking at everything, not just flooding, but I'm thinking when you just mentioned about the wires, are you actually surveying trees and branches yeah, it's, that it's, are... It's all hazards. Anything that is considered a potential hazard, that's what's included in this plan. Mm -hmm. This is being steered like, steered, like I said, through Essex County OEM, their, their engineering department, and it's every single municipality in the county, and public services included with this, and a few other uh, uh, utilities. So w this is an all-encompassing plan w with every single uh, entity, agency, and um, uh, public safety aspect that we can hopefully get involved with this particular program. And it sounds like preventative measures that you will actually be putting this plan in place prior to a proactive approach rather than wait for the storm. Correct. The Correct. Yeah. Okay. Councilman. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so uh, can you provide a picture of how uh, the response to Sandy would have been different should this plan have been in place back then? This isn't a res so much as a response in the sense of how we would have responded as a community uh, of, of an operational standpoint. This is more of a response of how some of our actions prior to may have uh, prevented some of the the uh, disasters we had, such as the, the trees and the wires and, and the overflowing of, of the rivers, which would have led to power outages, flooded basements, uh, right. things of that nature. That's what this plan is for. It's not to, to once a, a, an, an emergency happens or hazard happens, this plan doesn't get an effect to, for operational day, day to day. This is to try and prevent all that in the, in the future. This, so is, for this is forecasting. This is basically mm -hmm. what this is, it's right. forecasting. So, I mean, I, I guess, uh, a good way to paint a picture is to look at the Gregory neighborhood, uh, you know, that, that the whole area of those trees we had around. And Walker Road and everything mm -hmm. else. Road. Uh, right. So this would allow us to plan in advance to make sure that should uh, a natural disaster like that occur, it's going to trim trees. Trimming trees, underground wires, you know, things of that nature. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a cost to everything. Um, and some of these costs are either by the utility companies or by the municipality or by the, the, the federal government, whatever the, you know, whatever level it has to get to. But the, there's always a cost. I mean, the, <laughs> nothing's for free. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, that, and what this plan is doing is as, as a county, we're putting this plan together to submit to the state who will ultimately submit to the, the federal government that, that there may be some monies out there allocated to us for our particular projects within West Orange when it ultimately comes back down to West Orange. Does the plan that you're submitting have dollars in it, like the estimated cost of what? There's estimated cost, but mm -hmm. it's based on today's dollars and you know, okay. and, uh, you know how things work. Uh, it may, be, <laughs> may, be, may need to have some exceptions or added uh, cost to it. And then other things may arise, but this is a, this is a template of what we see right now. But doesn't mean that there isn't going to be other the other um, uh, uh, projects that may come down the road. And we are supposed to, on an annual basis, meet and update and and, and revise and let let them know see the progress, whether we're actually moving forward or we've identified other um, other sites that we have to address or consider. So, Council President, just oh. to finish my remarks, no. Councilman, I just want I do I do want to commend the proactiveness. Um, and uh, you know because uh, that that's kind of 
you know, part of the reason why we're in a, we're in a difficult situation uh, during Sandy. Um, so I do want to commend that. And also I do want to make a comment that um, a lot of times when there's like federal grants, federal funds, you, as you know, Chief, because you're very proactive in seeking additional funding out there, um, these are the types of uh, initiatives that get funded because they're already, they're on paper, they're enumer enumerated, and they're uh, specific examples mm -hmm. cited. So I commend you for the proactiveness. Thank you. Thank you. No, um, thank, thank you, Council President. Yeah, and to piggyback on what Councilman Cerro said, it is, it is proactive. So this is doing this. If you do this, this won't happen, or possibly the severity of the situation won't happen. So what you're saying, so with incorporated into this plan is working with utilities, PSC and G and the other in the county engineering to look at things and say, if you do this or this is what we're currently doing, this may not happen. Right. So Correct. Right. And this is, like I said, this is in draft form. This still has to be approved by higher authorities than we are. So it's a step, it's a process, but we, but they have to see that everybody's on board along the way. Right. And, this, and that's what the purpose of this resolution is, right. that the West Orange, Township of West Orange is okay with this type of plan that we are setting forth through you know, our administration up the chain and it gets approved by the county and so on and so forth. It, it may get cut, it may get changed, we don't know, but it, but it is our plan. And then, and in, in here we identified all the people who have been on our team to, to, uh, to take play, you know, take part in this particular process. And if I just may say, Chief, so, so basically, when we go for funding or any grants, this basically is the basis to support the grants. Well, yeah, they, and w w it was made very clear to us: if we don't participate, we don't get any funds. <laughs> okay. So it's carrot stick. I prefer the carrot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Okay. Yes, sir. A couple of quick questions. Uh, was there a reason why you couldn't provide this to the council, or I guess specifically to me, before the council meeting so that I could read it? Councilman, I was very busy the last two days. I had a lot of other priorities. I, uh, I apologize, but as, as the administrator spoke, um, I'm in the uniform service. I am in paramilitary. I follow chain of command. That's my boss. That's who I report to. If I get it to him as quickly as possible, I will. Plain and simple. Okay. And the second question is, do I, do I, is this correct and do I read this correctly that it says that the town of, it asks the council to uh, approve something that says the township of West Orange adopts in its entirety the 2014 Essex County multi-jurisdictional all hazards mitigation plan update. But from what I'm hearing, what you're saying is that update is not completed. So it's are we asking to be approved something that's not even done yet? You're being asked to approve what we've submitted. It's not done because it hasn't been approved on that level. What you're asking is, what you're doing is endorsing the work that we've put in, saying that, yeah, we agree with, the, the, with this local emergency planning council to adopt and, and present forward that this is what we want to have. And based on our experience and based on our, our, our work, we're asking you to pass this resolution on our behalf. That's what this is for. But it sounds like a work in progress. I mean, it's a work in progress. This is, this is as I explained to you, with the mutual aid uh, program and, and yeah. even our emergency operation plan, this is a living document. This plan constantly changes, even, even though it's in draft form. In order to be an effective plan of any kind of plan, when you're talking operations, it should be. While there are policies and procedures that are black and white, and that's how they have to stay, there are some things that have to be flexible, and they have to be a living document. And we, we make changes accordingly. We, we keep the history of what we did, and we, we make projections of what we need to do. Besides, and then as you meet as a group, though, so this is countywide. This is so countywide. So you can pick from other counties, too. I mean, not every plan is going to look the same, depending on... Well, this plan is just, sp sp our plan is specifically right. for West Orange, which will be tied into the county plan. Right. And as far as we're concerned, it's the only plan. Uh, but <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, when you meet as a group, you may find other things. Right, that and there's, and, are, and working back, this networking that we're doing is developing right. a plan that's, that is viable for everybody. And our partners at the county are a big help to us. And I, I've said this many, many times, our partners at the county are very helpful to us. You know, having the county OEM sitting in West Orange and developing a relationship makes things go a lot easier for everyone and especially in time of need and in times at requests. Great. Any so, other questions? So, so thank you. I don't have any other questions. I was just going to say uh, what's being said tonight is not how I read the, the, uh, the resolution and I'm just going to abstain from this because I haven't had a chance to even uh, read the draft. Okay. Okay, is there a motion to adopt resolution 141-14? So moved. Second. Thank you. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. 
Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Thank you, Chief. Council President, if, yes, sir. if I may, I can give this to the yeah, council. Yeah, I want a copy of that also. Thanks. Is that so you just received? Yeah. We just received. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Resolution 150-14, Councilman Krakowiak. Thank you. I had some questions about this uh, with Mr. Gross and I guess uh, the head of our health department that the proposed contract numbers do not correspond with what we're being asked to pay. And I raised the issue uh, in my questions and I got what I think is an incorrect answer. Uh, if you go to Exhibit A, uh, this, is for the, this is for the TB, uh, Tuberculosis Consulting Services, and Attachment A under uh, uh, Item 3 that starts Article 2 of the agreement is hereby modified by adding the following new sentence. The Township agrees to pay the medical school the sum of $4,752. It says $4,320 times 10% indirect cost for services rendered in 2014. It says the medical school will submit monthly invoices in the amount of $360 per month. And it breaks it down as $120 per hour for three hours beginning January 4th. Well, if you do the math, the number actually that comes up is different from that. The uh, document says $4,752. If you follow the formula, which is $360 times 12 months, you come up with $4,320. So you have a $432 discrepancy here. I raised this issue and was told by the health department, uh, health, the head of the health department and Mr. Gross that, that that's not inconsistent. So I'm bringing it up now because again, I, I don't think the contract is, is correct. If you pay that, you don't pay them all the money. And we'll be happy to have the savings. The maximum in this contract is 4,752. I think the response that, that we got from the health department was that the amount within the contract was the correct amount to put aside for it. So, I mean, the, certainly that's the most that it will, would cost if we pay the, the, the monthly amount and if there's nothing additional, then that's all we'll pay. Okay. Well, 10% of 4320 is 432 is 4725. So why don't we, why doesn't it, fit, yeah, right. why doesn't it fit, fit into the formula? Because otherwise we gypped them, $430. I, 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 can, I did not have opportunity to go through with her uh, all the okay. alternatives. Maybe there's, you know, some, some, for some reason there, there may be some other expenses that we will, may be responsible for to the amount of 10%. I don't know the answer to that. All I know is we're only going to pay what we're asked to pay. Up to a maximum of four thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. I certainly will have that discussion with him moving forward. Where do you know the difference? Okay. Um, I'm going to abstain on this as well. No more questions. Are there any other questions? No. Um, is there a motion to adopt resolution one fifty dash fourteen? So moved. Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. And Resolution 151-14, Councilman Krakowiak? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is a resolution that is going to allow uh, MetLife or a representative of MetLife to attempt to market and sell a variety of life insurance uh, services to full-time town employees. I don't know what that number is, 350? That sounds roughly right. About 300. So I, I, uh, I just raised the issue that uh, we are giving MetLife a, a marketing opportunity, uh, but we're not getting anything back for that. So I just wanted to flag this and ask if there was a legal reason why we couldn't charge MetLife or any other company that wants to solicit uh, sales uh, or purchases from our employees, whether we could uh, generate some revenue for the township by charging them for the privilege of marketing to uh, our employees. And uh, the answer was no, that's not. Uh, but there's nothing uh, in the law that says we can't open our employees to these various services. 
without charging them. So I just wanted to pull this because I, I think it's an opportunity for us to, uh, to generate revenue for the township in some way or, or matter. I'm also familiar with a lot of the big insurance companies and um, their marketing costs are, are typically estimated and built into the pricing of the product. So there would be no, uh, not, not any necessarily uh, increased marketing costs that would be passed along to these people because these products are probably being marketed to other people across New Jersey, if not across the country. So I just wanted to flag this. We can go to a vote, but I just didn't want to vote on this because I think it's an opportunity for us uh, to generate some revenue. And I'd ask that we consider this going forward as well. Just, just to I make a clear, motion just to, to extend this option to the existing employees. What was the question? I, I make a motion to uh, move forward with the resolution. Right. Okay, Can I, I wanted to hear the comment. Yeah, okay. I, I was just, just to be clear, our, our answer was that we didn't know of any preclusion. There uh, is. Quite frankly, uh, you know, to, to um, charging uh, access for that. Um, and the, the, the other, I can just say, my experience in many municipalities, I've never seen that. And that doesn't mean that it can't be done. Uh, however, um, I, I, I am certain that uh, someone, whether it be our employees or all of them, so, someone would pay those fees, whether it be directly just our employees or whether it be spread across um, um, some other larger group. It would be uncertain because, again, I've not, not experienced it before. But certainly if we add costs into um, doing a pro project like this, um, so, somewhere along the line those costs are going to and that, that, would, that would, would certainly result in some change in the rates uh, for employees. So that, that, that would be a concern that I would have about that. Just to follow up on Mr. Gross, um, we've been having this debate over the last couple of days, and unfortunately I didn't get the answer uh, before the meeting, but uh, there is a concept called rebating in insurance, and you're not allowed to rebate, uh, it's illegal. Um, I believe rebating would apply to this situation because we're asking an insurance company to rebate us money so that they can come in and sell a product. Uh, that's the first thing. So I believe that you can't do it because of the terminology called rebating. Um, but I, hadn't, I haven't gotten that answer from our legal department as of uh, the start of the meeting. Um, and the second issue is, I just want to be clear, we are not marketing any products for this insurance company. What we're doing is what every other township does is allowing them access to our employees. The marketing is going to be done by the insurance company. They're going to talk with our employees. If our employees want to participate on a voluntary basis, they can do that. If they do not want to participate, they don't have to participate. But we are doing no marketing for this company whatsoever. Mr. President, I do want to say that uh, just uh, on this note that sometimes uh, you know when you lease or you purchase a new vehicle, some of the auto dealers put their decal on your, on your vehicle and you're doing a free market. Maybe we should consider uh, as individuals uh, going, at, going, for, uh, going forward with uh, asking for some marketing uh, uh, fees for putting those decals in our cards. It's kind of like the same thing. I don't believe you, know, you can do it in the it's insurance not possible. industry. They're, 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 like I said, there's a legal terminology called rebating. It's, it, it's almost like getting a kickback for letting them come exactly. in and, and, exactly. and sell the insurance. I, I and not only that, but I, somebody will end up paying for that. And, and look, we're extending this to our, employee, our employees as, a, as an option uh, in terms of insurance. And, uh, uh, you know, should we start charging any fees, whatever it be, for marketing, administrative, or for the, uh, uh, for the right to do business with the, with the, uh, with, with the uh, township, it'll be passed on to our employees. I don't want to do that to the town. I, I'm not even worried about that. I, told, I honestly believe that it's illegal to do, and I did not get my response back from legal before the meeting started, but I do believe that rebating would apply to the situation. I don't think so my other question also was that this is not exclusive to MetLife. Right. This this no, can be any agency can in come in and do this. In so if there, okay. So if there uh, is really no time constraint on this, can we wait for the decision and reintroduce this at our next meeting? Well, either way, we're supporting it. We support mm -hmm. it because we want to we want to offer provide this for the employees a variety of things to mm -hmm. our employees, especially. This is the, we're, we're, we're we're dealing now. With, renegotiation of contracts and some of these issues as well. 
this is a very valuable benefit uh, to our to our staff because by be belonging to a group, they'll be actually be able to get um, life insurance they might not other, some some individuals might not otherwise be able to get because of being under a group. There's a certain threshold of, of coverage that you don't have to prove <coughs> health and you, know, you don't you don't have to, and, and you get better rates. So I think that's my, my I'm, if it is legal. My concern is is that. That if, if it's not direct, it will certainly be perceived by our staff that that we're building some costs into this right. that they will be paying, even if they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that that will be the the the, uh, uh, perception. the the perception of it. And then at the end of the day, you know, I, I could do a sensitivity analysis on it, but my guess is is that the 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 actual amount of revenues that would be raised would not be. Well, I would never you know, sneeze at any amount of revenue, um, but it would, certainly would not be a, a, a great significance. There is one other issue that we've always stayed away from, and that is that any time, whether it's a 401k or insurance, the companies want to come in and solicit township employees. We do not want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Because if, in fact, something goes wrong, the township then becomes part of whatever the issue, mm -hmm. the, the issue is. Like, there are some... Even with our investment companies that come in. We have nothing to do with them. We don't want anything from them. They deal directly with the employee. When things don't go right, it's between them and the employee. It's not between the township. Mm -hmm. So, you know, be that as it may, mm -hmm. we support this, this program only because it's going to offer, uh, actually it's going to offer four types of, uh, I think what this has is, uh, it's, it's going to be a life insurance component, an accident insurance component, a critical illness, uh, with cancer component and a disability component. Mm -hmm. So those are all things that they can, if in fact the employees want to participate, they can. I have a question, Council President, if, if I may. Okay. So, so what's the difference between this product and what you just described? Uh, wouldn't it be, uh, wouldn't it create the same situation where something goes wrong? Um, someone can uh, actually uh, uh, bring uh, some sort of legal action against the town in terms of the flow of benefits? No, we have nothing to do with it. The only thing we're agreeing to is if you as an employee sign a waiver that you're dealing directly with the insurance company that we will do a payroll reduction. Right, but you just said that you have refused to work with 401k companies because... Uh, no, we work with them, but they deal directly with the employees. If we start charging a 401k company to come in, now we're part of that. Okay. That's the issue. Okay, We don't want to be part of that. We I want to stay away from being part of that because that opens the township up to liability. Right. That's, the, that's another issue. This is really a supplemental benefit that's for all the employees. For employees mm -hmm. to talk to a, a, a private candidate. Mm -hmm. No more questions. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Is there a motion to adopt resolution 151-14? I made a motion. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Kokovac? No. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to ordinance. We have ordinance 2413-14, which is the employee status uh, Personnel changes per adoption in 2014 budget, title consolidations in the health department. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Kropoviak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. One second. Is there any public comment on this ordinance 24-13, 24 13-14? 24 no. Right. Okay. Do we have any questions on this? Uh, just a technical question. I, I don't understand why um, there's two different ordinances. Uh, they kind of like do the same thing, which changes uh, classifications and titles. Or two different. Well, one, the, the one that is you're that voting on department? now is an, is an ordinance which corrects um, a previous ordinance. 
um, which, uh, which was strictly to implement uh, consolidation of titles and um, the and, and budget changes. Right. Uh, the next the, the next ordinance you're talking about is one that's specifically towards uh, communication operators. Right. And this one is the health department. This is this would this is as it turns out it's the health department. But it's not just the health. It, it, it's a, it's a there was a previous ordinance that had some mistakes in it or omissions that that needed to be corrected. And that's why it's two different ones. The titles are different. So okay. So. Uh, uh, 24-13-14 uh, amends uh, an existing ordinance, and 24-15 uh, introduces a new, uh, new contract range. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt ordinance 24-13-14? So Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Ordinance 2414-14 is an ordinance to designate uh, the intersections of Marshall Street and Phyllis Road and Home Street and Phyllis Road as stop intersections with stop signs on Marshall Street and Home Street. Make a motion to introduce on second and final reading. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Any comments on the stop sign at Marshall Street and Holmes? Seeing none, I make a motion to adopt Ordinance 2414 14. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Kokoviak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. And 2415-14 is another um, salary guide. Uh, this is title consolidation, senior communications operator, communication bilingual operator. Is there a motion to introduce on second and final reading? So moved. Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Any comments on the title? Consolidation. Seeing none, I make a motion to adopt Ordinance 2415-14. So, so moved. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Ordinance 2416-14 is the ordinance that will designate a portion of Glenview Drive between Northfield Avenue and Beacon Place as a restricted parking street. A restricted parking street is a residential street where parking is prohibited except by permit and permits are only issued to the residents. The, propose, the purpose of this designation is to curtail parking on the street by nearby and adjourning non-residential uses make a motion to introduce on second and final reading. Is there a second? Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? <laughs> yes. Council President McCourtney? Yes. Would anyone from Glenview? Yes, sir. Please. And that's fine. Gene, just state your name and address. Gene Riley, 6 Glenview Drive. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Gene Riley. Gene Riley, 6 Glenview Drive. Thank you. Uh, Larry Mandel, 8 Glenview. Welcome back. Hello, Council, Mr. Sayers. We would hope way. that you would all pass this tonight because um, as I spoke to uh, Councilwoman McCartney the other day on the phone, that our street is loaded with traffic cones. And we need our street back. Mm -hmm. Our street is a municipal park lot for Livingston. We want our street back. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The years that we put up with this, it's time that we get our street back. Thank you, Gene. <clears throat> um, I just want to follow up to some two points. Um, obviously, speaking with uh, Mr. Lepore, who's I guess not here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, from what I gathered, signs are being created or will be created once this is right. passed. Mm -hmm. Um, I, we have, or I have two requests, one that either coming from 
the council or the mayor that a, some kind of maybe certified letter is sent to the pizza business, I don't know if you want me to mm -hmm. specifically name the master pizza, um, be sent to them as a one-time warning because the next time if any of their drivers are found on the street the police will issue tickets, summons, whatever they need to do. Or the, the mayor send this letter, the police chief send this letter, um, but a letter is sent to them directly. Letting them know. Letting them know that the right. ordinance has been passed, they are on notice. Um, and the second request, and I, I see there's a couple officers, I don't know if they're with the traffic division or not. Um, I know I've spoken to Lieutenant Morella a couple mm -hmm. times, but if the police can make it part of their shift rounds, whatever they term it, um, especially during like 11 to new or 11 to 1 p.m. and 4 to 7, 4 to 8. It sounds like all day, every day. It, yeah, but it's primarily the lunch hours and the dinner hours right. that we have especially problems. And mm -hmm. this morning at 11 a.m. was no different. There were three cars one side there were two and when you get cars coming up from Northfield and we trying to exit it's it, it's literally it's, it's gonna be an accident and I'm shocked that there hasn't been so if the police can make it part of their rounds to do spot checks because okay. I'll tell you I mean we're talking about kids and young adults making a buck and they they don't care so if the police okay. are making a stand that they'll get the message so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilman. Council President, I, I want to ask um, if there was a reason why Herbert Terrace was not included in this proposal. Because you know it's going to be displaced, so the traffic here is just going to move somewhere else. I'm not sure why. Mr. Lepore set this up. He's, he's on vacation this week. I'm not so sure why Herbert Terrace was included in that. I know he wanted to get this done so that we can. Uh, what would be the uh, process to amend this? Um, You'd have to restart the whole ordinance over yeah. again. It's a major change. Because uh, if if the issue is of uh, you know I, I see that uh, there is a commercial area. It is a commercial area. If the the problem is uh, the commercial establishments, perhaps what yeah what I would do is I would just move to the other street. Right. Well. And we've yeah. seen that so many times with so parking. So we just we would do it in a. We just do another. Right. Just do another ordinance because this way we don't we don't hold up. The, I'm Actually, sorry. my suggestion would be you pass this ordinance, and while we're implementing it, you could probably amend this ordinance and add her. But that's going to take. It'll be a separate. Right. It'll be a separate ordinance. Right. But it could be amendment. Yes. Come out. Come up. If I could, my understanding is that first block of Herbert Terrace up to Beacon Place is Livingston property, so we Livingston land, so we wouldn't have any say on that. Part of it is West Orange. What, right. The, you say that again, Jody? My understanding is, and perhaps people who live there can confirm that. So. I was just going to say that um, that part of Livingston from Northfield Avenue up to Beacon is in Livingston. Um, from Beacon up is West Orange. That's too far. They're not going to park that far long, to long. deliver pizza. Yeah, yeah. By the time they get there, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, face it. They, they want to. They want to get in their car and go. And their park lot is only approximately maybe eight spaces. It's primarily a takeout business. We know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, right. It's and disgusting. And you live on a residential street, um, and you don't live in a parking lot. Mr. Mandel, his driveway, he gets all the big vehicles, from cement trucks to buses, and the rest of us generally get small cars turning around. Um, we've had full check the trailers. We've had um, New York City buses park on our street. He runs in and gets a pizza, and it's time that it ends. Mm -hmm. We get drag racing. We get the radios. It's all day, every day. Three days out of the year, our street is quiet. Thanksgiving, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day. That's it. We would like to see this ordinance pass and let Livingston deal with their problem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. No. Thanks. Yep. 
Well, thank you all for coming out. I'm sorry this really has taken so long. This is really the first time when this was introduced on first reading at our July meeting. It was really the first time I heard about it. So uh, I understand you've been dealing with this for a long time. I wish I'd come sooner. Um, I'm going to make a motion to adopt. You have to close public comment. Madam Clerk? If, does anybody else wish to be heard on this? You do? Oh, yeah. Ms. Sorry. Name and address, please. My name is uh, Robert Mandel. I live at 8 Glendale Drive, my son. Um, there are many times when there are cars, like I said, vehicles on both sides of the street. Mm -hmm. And one time I was coming up, another car was coming down, and another of uh, these delivery clowns was pulling out. I didn't miss them by that much. And I, I would have been, I would have been thrown into Livingston. So it's, it's just unbelievable. I mean, you know, I've been living here since 1981, Lindy Drive. Forget my taxes at that time, the whole year was $1,452. <coughs> and now, fortunately, I'm capped at 8,400. That's, well, that's another story, but I think for 8,400, I should get a little, and especially in a weird time, when you're trying to go up and, and the snow is piled on the side where the, where the plows have to leave it, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing is that if we do get these permits and whatever, how, I know we're, we, you can't really stop it completely because the police have more valuable things to do than to post an unmarked car or somebody, uh, you know, undercover and, and, and taking pictures of it all day long. I mean, you can't do that. There are going to be times when there are going to be there no matter what. But to have a regular shift go by, you know, comes up, goes around, if he sees the car, he stops. That's, that's great revenue. So I mean, they can make millions. So there are going to be instances where they're not going to everybody, and I understand that. But uh, at least, you know, the general councilman over here with this, the revenue with the insurance and this and that, that's fine to have, you know, revenue coming in. This is, this is a gold mine. I'm serious. I'm, 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 not, I'm not joking. The police department will have to, you might have to spend more money getting the uh, paper company to print out more tickets because you'd be, boom. Okay. So, you know, you go. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other public Any comments? Any other comments? Is there a motion to adopt Ordinance 2416-14 on second and final reading? So moved. Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Kokrovia? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Oh, there you go. Okay. We'll check with our engineer for the process. Mr. Mandel, thank you for making all of those suggestions. I'm sure that that is part of the process, certified letter, signage. I will make sure also that we will okay. do direct the patrols in that neighborhood. Thank you. You got it. Okay. Sorry it took so long. Ordinance is okay. on Good first night. reading. Ordinance 2417-14. Ordinance 2417-14 is an ordinance requiring the installation of a key lockbox emergency access system for use by the West Orange Fire Department during an emergency or any other action deemed necessary by the fire department, adding this section uh, to Chapter 18 of the Municipal Code. Maddie, you're here. You want to say two words? Me. I'm uh, Captain Matthew Longo. I'm the fire official for uh, Township. Um, the Knox Box Ordinance is, um, you know, Councilman he issued a few questions. I just got them late, so <clears throat> to uh, answer a couple of your questions. The cost of a Knox Box is about $300 to $400 for the business. Um, there's plenty of Knox Boxes in town right now that are being utilized. It's a, an invaluable tool for the fire service because it allows us access to the building without causing any damage. So it's going to save the businesses money in the long run. It's going to be an upfront expense, but eventually it's going to save the businesses money because we don't have to force a door or break a window or mm -hmm. to gain access uh, forcibly. 
where we can just use the key uh, for incidents that we go to, fire alarms, where we don't see visible smoke or fire, but we still need to need investigate to. and confirm that there's nothing inside the building. So for that, uh, we spent many hours waiting for a key holder, so to speak, for us, for someone to come, because we don't see smoke or fire. We're not going to just cause damage unnecessarily. So uh, we wait, and it puts a company out of service for you know up to an hour or so. And you know other calls are coming in, and that company is tied up and not seen. You know when it's not a really an emergency. So for that reason, it's uh, you know unvaluable. Um, I don't know what the other questions you had. It was something was the cost. Yes, thank you, and, and I appreciate you uh, filling in and uh, uh, responding to the, the questions. One of my one of my concerns was what's going to be the impact on the business community of the the actual property owner. So I was just asking for for numbers as to how many how many right. entities so, that you. So the businesses we're going to require to obtain a Knox box basically is going to be a commercial business, uh, which uh, operates with a automatic sprinkler detection or sprinkler system or an automatic fire alarm, which is central central monitored by an alarm company. So. If like the mom and pop type stores on Main Street have a fire alarm, but it's not hooked up to Central Station, we're not going to require them to have a knock box. It's more the the bigger um, square footage stores, office buildings. Uh, there's like I said, drill building right next door. They utilize it. All the schools have them. Uh, there's many businesses in town that already have them. Uh, the, the the heart facility, the all the organ on, they utilize it. So I can go on and on, to, but so. It's just the, the businesses that have automatic detection systems that send a signal to central dispatch that dispatch the fire department. Those will be the businesses that will require a Knox box. It sounds like you guys have had, it sounds like you guys have been proactively trying to get uh, the, the buildings well, to do this. Have you had success mm -hmm. doing that? Yes, I mean, uh, Council President McCartney, we, I sit in the tech review meetings anytime a new business or new structure is like the CVS on Eagle Rock and Prospect, like we always at our recommendation is to install a Knox box. So the process has been ongoing. We've been doing it proactively, um, but now we're just trying to uh, retrofit the businesses that, that don't have them. There's a lot of businesses that will do it voluntarily, they right. just don't know about it. So mm -hmm. it's never an issue. So well, Maddie, will gonna this be part of the inspection? So it's going to be part, part of the inspection, inspection process. Right. So as our inspectors do the inspections and they notify that uh, they do the inspections and they observe that there's an automatic alarm or sprinkler system at that, that property, they will notify the business owner that it's an ordinance, it's a requirement now that you have to obtain a knock box. And you know, we'll obviously work with the business owners, give them time to comply, you know, and, and uh, be uh, you know, reasonable with them. You know, we're not going to be demanding on them if they can't afford it or, or whatever reason. We'll work with them to, uh, to comply. So any estimate, any even rough estimate as to how many buildings we're talking about? Well, will be just to give you an idea, right now we roughly, we have close to 500 what we call non-life hazard use inspections and approximately 225 life hazard use inspections, which requires a state license inspector to inspect. So we have over 700 inspection, uh, uh, commercial buildings that we're inspecting every year. So, um, you know, roughly it could be anywhere from, you know, half of that, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And the 300 to 400 dollar cost does that include just the just the box just itself? The does box. that include all the work they got to do to get all it's, the information? There's, there's surface mounted there, so if you have a masonry out front or wood, front, you know you can you bolt them basically to the structure. It's not a huge expense to get them mounted. Okay, thank you. Yep. Right, and you're right. We have been making them conditions of um, applicants that come before the planning board. Any other questions? Thanks, Manny. Manny. Any other questions? If I could, as long as, as as long as you're up here, can you uh, just the address next ordinance? Yeah, the next one. Sure. So okay. the next ordinance is Save you some time. is uh, is an indicator light for what we call the fire department connection, which is where the fire department will hook up our hoses to supplement the sprinkler system. So right now, uh, that ordinance we're not requiring anybody to retrofit if they have a sprinkler system in place right now and they don't have one. That's okay. But moving forward. Um, what myself and uh, Tom Tracy, the construction official, suggested that any major renovation or any new structure that goes up will require what we call a, um, an indicator light that goes over the fire department connection so it's visible 
for us to see and it's easy for us to locate and it doesn't delay uh, the fire department supplementing the sprinkler system. So um, there's there's buildings in town that that have that also. We've been like again, mm -hmm. uh, President uh, Council President Susan McCartney and I we, we, in, the, in the tech review meetings were recommending that the new structures and the rec and the structures that are going on the major renovation comply with that. And you know we haven't met any resistance. Everyone's you know all for it. A Tudor time is an example of a building that's going under uh, the old echo going on the major renovation they're they're going to comply with that they're going to put the light out there uh, the zoo in the county um, yeah. the arena they already they already use it the the, the school Solomon Schechter school on Northfield and Gregory they they just recently renovated they put a light on this uh, fire department connection so so it's less expensive to do this isn't it mm -hmm. than, than to do the Knox box the indicator light yes or could it be well, no, it, no, you actually need both. One has nothing to do with the other. The right. nice box gains us entry to the building without uh, having to wait for a response. The indicator light is basically for the fire department for us to know where the fire department connection is so right. we can locate it more easily, especially right. at night. So how much would it cost a, a building owner to put in the, the light? The cost for that, I'm not really sure, but it's you know anything uh, when they're doing a major renovation it's going to be a you know part of that cost i don't think it's just basically running a, um, a mm -hmm. conduit with a light fixture outdoor outdoor fixture and it gets a battery backup in case of a power outage it's not a huge expense it's not going to uh, add a, a huge cost to the, the total renovation and it sounds like it's going to be it's going to be impacting fewer a lot fewer buildings than that one is yes because okay. it's only the buildings that work. are getting renovated major renovation or a new structure going in okay. so that that has a sprinkler system only, thank you. only buildings with sprinkler right. systems. Right. thank right. you very helpful thank okay. you. so captain yeah. so captain what's saying is you're going to basically save time finding the the the, uh, the siamese connection right correct so basically when the trucks pull up if it's snowing or they don't know exactly where this will direct yeah, a lot them right times to they're they're hidden you know we try to keep them clear obviously but sometimes they're getting overgrown with shrubs or something and you know like i said it's going to delay uh, a response for us okay. to to hook up so and i'm sure the insurance companies will look at this too as a benefit i'm because sure in the knox box and the light would help with insurance purposes yes okay but thank it's... you captain okay thank you. thank you thank you so i'm going to make a motion to adopt resolution uh, sorry ordinance 2417-14 on first reading second introduce introduce yeah on first reading second Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. And Ordinance 2418 14 for the connection indicator light. I make a motion to introduce on first reading. So moved. Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Ordinance 2419-14 is the ordinance uh, restricting feeding of wildlife. I make a motion to introduce on first reading. Motion moved. Second. And I would also have a member of the health department to um, answer questions uh, when it comes up for second reading. Could I just raise an issue to, uh, tonight? Before they go? Or was that a, a not, fire Not fish? really. Okay. No, 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 no. This is for the, the, the uh, item that's now okay. on floor. I, uh, resident raised the issue with this um, at public comment, and I, I do have some concerns about it too, and I just wanted to ask, because I did get some answers to the questions uh, from the, health, the head of the health department, and I, I just want to make sure that if we decide that we need to change the language in this, that we do it now and uh, not wait until the next council meeting to decide we're not going to do it. It's, it goes what was to the, the suggestion of it? Yeah, it goes to the, it goes to the issue of the, the wording of the ordinance prohibits all feeding of un, uh, uncaptivated wildlife in the township. And I, when I raised that issue uh, with the administration, I, the answer was, I think, and I don't want to paraphrase it too much, but basically we know it when we see it. Uh, it's just focused on feral cats and uh, wouldn't uh, it sounds like it wouldn't be enforced for other wildlife and i'm thinking about the bird feeders and uh, i haven't even uh, thought this through completely but i just wondered if the ordinance should say specifically that uh the prohibition is against 
uh, some situation where there's an actual problem. I mean, if we're trying to do this for feral cats, why don't we just write the ordinance for feral cats uh, and not make it so broad as to encompass all wildlife? Council President, I mean, had I drafted the ordinance and I did not, um, I probably would have put in an exception for birds since I happen to be someone who has a lot of bird feeders in their yard. Uh, but uh, I, I did discuss it with um, Mr. Trank or Mr. Duffy, I think it was Mr. Duffy actually. Um, and I think I agree with him that it's clear from the language in the whereas clauses and the overall language in the ordinance that it's intended to apply for feral cats. I don't know why it wouldn't also apply, for example, to feral dogs, because we have some of those too, and they can be a problem, although I don't think people generally feed them. Um, people are generally afraid of them as opposed to feral cats. But um, I mean, I don't have a problem either way. I mean, if you pass the ordinance t tonight, well, it's, not, it's on first reading, right. so it's just for introduction. Um, I don't see, uh, I mean, clearly the town is not going to enforce this ordinance as though birds were included. I mean, common sense. But, um, but if you wanted to add that kind of language, you could. I don't know what other kinds of animals other than the feral cats might be subject to this ordinance. I, you know. Squirrels. Could be, could be, could be um, pigeons. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a, you know, at any time that there, there's any type of, of feeding that occurs that creates, could potentially create a, a health hazard. Mm -hmm. That's what this would apply to. Mm -hmm. and, and just to follow up on that, I can tell you, I get a, we just got one last week. Uh, somebody was feeding animals in the yard and they, there was a possum in the guy's yard, in this resident's yard, and they wanted us to go up there and take the possum out of the yard, and we did, and we had to speak to the people next door who were feeding the animals. It's just, uh, again, this is, as Mr. Kayser said, obviously this is not going to, um, the intent is not to tell you to take the bird feeder out of your backyard. The intent here is for wild animals, not wild animals, but animals that people tend to feed. We've had coyotes that we've removed. We've had scums, wild dogs, wild, wild dogs, dogs possums, uh, groundhogs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can name you a whole bunch of things that we've right. been removing from people's houses through our uh, um, uh, through our uh, uh, health department, but the main concern with this was the feral cats because we've had a lot of complaints with people who were dealing with that, and mm -hmm. uh, they do create a health hazard. But you know, if you want to change the language, I don't have a problem with that either. I just, I just, I don't want to change the language. picking up a newspaper and it's yeah. saying, you know, West Orange bans feeding of all wildlife just well, to get rid of a feral cat problem. If you pick up a newspaper and see that they're banning cats. You have a lot more people at this meeting. That's a great job. Even feeding ducks. That's you are right. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like a tickler there. We'll raise a lot of eyebrows. I, I don't want to change the language, but I will have a health official here at the next meeting to, to explain. Okay. Make a motion to introduce on first reading ordinance 2419-14. 2420. Um, I'm sorry, 2020. I'm, I'm sorry, you already did the motions. I need a okay. vote. So, Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Krakowiak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Okay, Ordinance 2420 14 is an ordinance amending our Chapter 7 traffic uh, turn prohibition. Uh, of the revised general ordinance on Oak Ridge Road and Hazel Avenue. Okay, I make a motion to introduce on first reading. So moved. Let's see. Is there a second? Second. Any comments? No, no there are no comments no, on first reading. Okay. Councilman Cirillo? There are comments. Not on first reading. We like just. Like <laughs> There's not supposed to be any comments on first oh. reading. <laughs> All right. Well, what, but there are residents here, and if you have any comments on Oak Ridge yeah. Avenue or Hazel Avenue, you're welcome to make a comment. Uh, this is on Oak Ridge and Hazel? Yes. On first reading. 
No. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Kokoviak? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. How about Ordinance 2421-14? This is parking prohibited at all times on certain streets, alternate side parking um, on Cary Street. Make a motion to introduce on first reading. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Kokovia? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Carrie Street? Twenty four twenty two dash fourteen ordinance amending and supplementing chapter seven traffic parking prohibited for street cleaning and maintenance prohibited at all times on certain streets night parking restrictions on certain streets uh, this pertains to Rollinson Street so motion to introduce on first reading so moved is there a second 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 Councilman Cirillo? Yes. Councilman Garino? Yes. Councilman Kokovia? Yes. Councilwoman Spango? Yes. Council President McCartney? Yes. Rollinson? That concludes our agenda. Council President, if I yes, could. Sir. Uh, there was some reference to uh, the change in the ordinance about our uh, agendas and meetings. and. There was a mention of matters pending, and I just wanted to bring up an issue that I'd like to raise to the council. I know matters pending isn't on the agenda. It's never been on the agenda since the, uh, the ordinance was passed, but as maybe uh, other council people know, uh, PRISM is currently delinquent on more than $700,000 in property taxes in the redevelopment area downtown, and it's apparently been in default on the mortgage on its property at 217 Main Street since uh, late 2011. And what I'd like to do is either now or perhaps at the next meeting uh, have a discussion about um, what the council may want to do about it. I know that the mayor and the legal council have advised us that as a council that we don't have any direct responsibility in the redevelopment at this point. I don't agree, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, but I'd like to consider a resolution that would urge the mayor to issue another event of default letter uh, based on the delinquent taxes and another letter. Uh, asking for the status of the 217 Main Street property. I don't know if you want to try to deal with it now or we can put it on the agenda for the next meeting. I know right. you said you're not going to put on the agenda uh, the previous issue that I raised, but I would like to either address this tonight or, or perhaps at the next meeting. I think I'll find out what the status is because I know their permits are coming, through, coming due, so uh, there would be plenty to discuss. So, so we'll just add this to the next council meeting? Possibly, if oh. find out more. When you say what we're possibly, doing. I, I really I would, would like, like to, to find out more information first okay. before we commit to putting this on the agenda. Well, I, I checked with our database before the meeting, and they're delinquent on $700,000 in property tax. It's right. not the, it's not the, the, uh, and they also have the pending. most they've ever been delinquent on, but right. it's getting pretty close. Mm -hmm. Can you explain again what that would do? I'm sorry. I just go back. Explain what that would do. We would put what on the agenda resolution? I'd like to put on matters pending the issue of uh, PRISM's continuing uh, delinquency and property taxes, which is in direct violation of the 2006 redevelopment agreement, and also uh, ask about the status of the delinquent mortgage at 217 Main Street, which is the CVS property. If you recall in the financial statements that we got, the auditor was saying that uh, they've been delinquent on that mortgage for a few years. They had been trying to sell that property, but the sale had fallen through, and that was sort of the limit of the, uh, the financial statements, and we haven't seen anything ahead uh, since then, but since there were issues then, obviously there are issues now. So I wanted to raise those two issues. We ask the administration to give us a status on uh, their tax situation and the permits that are coming pending. I think you just got the status. Well, <laughs> you're right. Sure and about the permits. The permits That's what we have to I find out. I can check it out with Mr. Tracy. Please. Do we know how long the, the uh, deficiency is? Yeah, it's been three quarters. 
Three and it's on it's on every property that they own in the redevelopment agreement in the redevelopment area. And isn't there a process where uh, uh, delinquent taxes are sold to lien holders? Do you know if that's that's been sold? correct? There is. Okay. So that's one so issue. The other issue is it is in violation of the redevelopment agreement. It is an event of default. The township a couple of years ago actually sent out a letter, a notice of default, and it was cured because of, and it was sent out because of delinquent taxes. That was, at the time we sent that letter out, it was about a fifth, about 20% of what the delinquent taxes are now. And how is that affecting us right now? The, the you can ask Mr. Gross no, no, what, asking, whether he could. I'm asking you because you're, you're making a proposal. Yes, how, well, is what that, you, how is that affecting West Orange? Well, you can ask Mr. Gross. I'm well, sure I'm he would. You, you brought it up. I'm, I, as a representative of the of the of uh, the township, sure. I would like us to have that seven hundred thousand dollars instead of uh, sitting here waiting for it to come in. I'm sure it will. And, and, and if there's a, a lien will be sold, if the, if the if the property owner doesn't pay the property taxes, the lien would be sold, and the town will get its money. Right. Plus, plus interest. Two years ago, we sent out a notice of default when they were delinquent on the taxes about a fifth of where they are now. So if it was good for $123,000 of delinquent taxes, why would it not be good now that it's over $700,000 and, and it covers every property in the redevelopment area that they own except the property at 217 Main Street where I believe the uh, mortgage holder is paying the taxes. Right, but, but, but those taxes will be collected. I don't understand what the point is. If, 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 uh, if a resident owner, a commercial a property owner, doesn't pay the taxes and it's sold in the market, and then that month we recapture that money, and then it's, it's up to the plus interest. Actually, what's the interest rate? Eighteen percent. Eighteen percent. Eighteen percent interest uh, on those three quarters. So we actually could make a revenue. Uh, I don't know what the uh, guidelines are in terms of what how, how long the township or a municipality waits until that's sold to. Um, potential uh, lien uh, investors, mm -hmm. but that money will be collected. Just but like it's not being collected. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. No, I apologize. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say it's the $700,000 that we should have that we don't. And there's another issue, and the issue, the other issue is that PRISM is clearly in default on the terms of the 2006 redevelopment agreement. So how is that affecting the residents of West Orange? That property is sitting out there. Un, uh, with no progress going forward, the weeds are so tall they're over the 10 or 12 foot fence. You can now see the but weeds I think over there. Any other properties that are in the same condition? That's fine. You can do that. I'm just focused it's not on. Not costing us any money. Oh, it's. <laughs> How is that? We have to spend a cent. <laughs> what are you talking? About? What do you mean? Um, they've had the approval to do this for almost two years as as council president. The permits uh, are coming due. If they can't pay their property taxes, if they can't pay their mortgage, then how, why are we sitting here waiting for them not to redevelop for how many more years? That's the issue. We have. But there is pending litigation right now. I'm just saying that that's If I could just, right just, just one more thing. We have a contract with PRISM right. since 2006. The contract is clear, and we should enforce that contract so that we reserve our rights under the contract. And for us to continue to ignore an event of default, I think, hurts us legally in whatever happens in the future. So I think if the administration isn't going to move on it, I think the council should at least consider it an urge in the form of a resolution that the administration move forward on this. So how do you say it hurts us legally? You said it hurts us legally in the long term? How is that? Yes. I guess you could get Mr. Kayser, but if you have responsibilities under a contract and you don't try to enforce them, then you, it hurts your case if you then come back to court and say, I want to enforce them. Then the other side comes in and says, well, you didn't try to enforce them two or three years ago. Council President. Yes, Council. It, it's, it's my recollection, and maybe Mr. Kayser can say it better, but we've already had this discussion, and I believe that Mr. Kayser told Councilman Krakowiak and us that we do not have the legal right to, this is an administrative, this is a mayor decision, correct? Uh, correct, generally, but I was going to try to answer the councilman's question. You've done this already, but okay, do it. That's what I, I want to hear. All, uh, there is, an, what the, the concept that you're talking about is waiver, and there's an anti-waiver provision in the agreement so that we're protected. Um, 
and our redevelopment council specifically provided that section to protect us so that we don't have to move for a default in every instance. We can wait and hopefully shouldn't affect us. So, but that's the reason that provision is in there. Um, the other thing is that they own the property. Unlike most redevelopers who come in and don't own the property and just have an agreement to redevelop, uh, and often the property is owned by the municipality, um, in this instance, PRISM owns the property in question. So we are fully protected in terms of the taxes. Uh, that property, at some point, if they defaulted and they went into bankruptcy, for example, we would get paid all of our money. I don't know what else to say so other than that. I guess, my, I guess what I was trying to ask you, there is, is there any point for this to be on the agenda for the council to, or, I mean, we don't have that power. Well, whether, whether, whether any redeveloper is put in default is a strategic question as much as anything. Um, so any discussion about it would be an executive session so that redevelopment council could advise the council what its options were and, and you know, and it is principally a matter for the mayor as under the Faulkner Act, he is responsible for managing contracts and this is a contract. Right. Thank you. So if I could just ask a follow-up, if, if, the, if the administration is, is okay with PRISM being delinquent $700, more than $700,000 in property taxes and the project does not appear to be moving forward, how long are we going to wait, uh, how long are we going to wait to get paid our property taxes or for the project to move I, forward? I don't, I don't want to say that the administration is okay with what's going on. <laughs> I don't think they are. I think we want this project to be built. Uh, but there are economic forces out there that, you know, are probably stronger than our ability to act. Um, so for the time being, I think we're waiting and hoping um, at some point that may well change. And again, that's a tr strategic issue that would have to be discussed with council. Uh, and we'll see what happens. I do want to ask, uh, and maybe uh, our CFO can uh, can enlighten us on, on the uh, tax collection process. I mean, I, I would think that this is just like any other business that is in a situation, or a property owner is in a situation where property taxes haven't been paid. Uh, are there time frames uh, as it relates to uh, we, when we we can? Uh, we have the same forward? protections. We have the same protections as we have for uh, with any other uh, taxpayer. Um, one, once a prop, once property is delinquent into the next year, we can set a tax sale at any time. Gen generally, we don't do our tax sale until October. Um, that is that increases our you know the fees that we may get uh, okay, so from we that. Can, gonna but but that. if if t whatever taxes are due as of 12 31 2014 uh, that are not go unpaid in 2015, the township can go to tax sale immediately if it chooses to. Thank you. Okay. So does that mean we're going to have a matters pending agenda item at the next meeting? Or we, don't have, we don't have matters no, pending. It, well, not necessarily, but it, we could have an executive session when we get information about uh, the status. Okay. Let's have an executive session so we can I find can, out what's going on. That would right. be a great idea. <clears throat> make a motion to adjourn. And wish everyone a um, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of their summer. <coughs> Safe and healthy. Safe and happy. <laughs> <laughs>